get this set up. Put my my fake glasses on. Happy Sunday. Welcome. Hi Abdullah. Hi Travis. Oh, who else is here? Hi, thank you for the likes. Much appreciated. Um, we are listening to, I don't know if you can hear this. It's called How to Disappear Completely by Meredith's one and two, or I don't know. I know what the Meredith's is, ocean of something on in the woods is that is that backwards that's funny youtube always changing up things hi welcome I'm gonna see all the chat here. <laughs> Sunday fun day. I have some short stories to read. Here, in fact. give you the power I have given you power <clears throat> let's see I know a couple of people who wanted to show up but couldn't so they will be catching the replay so on the replay ace I got my lurking friends. If you're lurking, you should really you might step up. Plugged in. I'm fully charged. If I have to plug in later, I will. Hi, welcome. Thank you. The likes and subscribes go a long way. We are definitely getting up there towards 6K already. So thank you again for all the new subscribers. Um, let's see. I have one story that I want to start with. So let me see where that one is. Ooh, I like that one too. I, <laughs> I found this book <clears throat> in the most random of ways in a used bookstore. Basically, I think it was the only used bookstore in my hometown. Um, and I think it was like the only hippies in my hometown too, like that owned a business anyway. So um, not, I'm not going to be reading them in order, but this is Afterlives. Stories about life after death by J.G. Ballard, James Blish. Harlan Ellison, Ursula K. Levin, and others. Edited with an introduction by Pamela Sargent and Ian Watson. Uh, 20 stories and two poems, many published here for the first time, that explore with brilliant imagination and consummate artistry the multifaceted question of life after death. What happens when we die? Is there a world waiting for us when we leave this one? Is it possible to return? And with what consequences? In Afterlives, you will find answers by some of the major voices in contemporary science fiction, some hauntingly real, others wildly innovative, all masterfully written and uniquely compelling. And um, I didn't know who any of these authors were. When I picked this up, I had, um, just started getting into science fiction and um, coffee at the same time. <clears throat> so this bookstore coffee shop, I mean, and this was just random too. Um, it wasn't on a shelf yet. It was 
waiting to be shelved. So it was like not on the bookshelf. I was like, is this for sale? Um, and then I come to find out like years later, I love a lot of these authors. Uh, another thing you guys might not know is I've lost all of my possessions a couple of times and it wasn't really my fault. So this is one of the few books I took with me and didn't get destroyed or lost or given away. Um, so out of my original book collection that I had when I was a teenager, this is maybe the only book I have left. I had one other and I lost track of it <clears throat> about eight, eight or nine years ago. So this might literally be the last book that, from my original huge library collection of books from my teen years. So it's like, yeah. And this is the same copy. Like I have a thing about the same, having the same copy of a book for a long time. I don't know. Is that weird? Does anybody else do that? Hi, welcome. Okay. Don't make me block you. Thank you. How do I say that? Zenzel, thank you. Hi, Hadi. Hi, Gokan. Welcome, you guys. Thank you for the likes. Okay. So, um, have since, like, just, thank you. Um, yeah. Really, I really like a lot of these authors. So, I love that this book just kind of like fell into my possession oh where is Ursula K look in that one is the one that's been in my head lately and I need to read it first because I can't stop thinking about it she passed away um just a few years ago and <laughs> I almost had a chance to like see her doing a book read live um, and I missed it and I was like oh I'll do it next year because she does it like every year nope I missed out she passed away the day before my birthday too and so I was like hmm I woke up to the news I was like that is it's not great I'm not, you know how dare someone you guys are not allowed to die the day before my birthday or on my birthday okay <sighs> quote in the beginning but man dies and is laid low man breathes his last and where is he job 14 okay small change page 247 Small Change also appears in another collection of her work. But this story is so good. I think this was the first time it was published and then she did her own collection later. <clears throat> oh. Small Change, Ursula K. Le Guin. The roll call of Le Guin's publications and awards is well known, and her preeminence as a major literary figure is so well established that it seems like strange in ancient history to disinter a first edition of one of her earliest novels, City of Ill Illusions, and discover the packaging of this 50 cent ace book from 1967 posing the question, was he a human meteor or a time bomb from the stars? No publisher today would advertise a title by Ursula Le Guin in quite that way. She and science fiction have moved onward and upward, the latter in no small part thanks to the influence of her writings. Another slice of ancient history is the time when Playboy magazine insisted that her story Nine Lives appear under the byline UK Le Guin since Playboy's male readers wouldn't readily accept a science fiction story written by a woman. Science fiction by women authors has a long since transcended that moment. Again, no small thanks to Ursula Le Guin. Now, nowadays Le Guin finds some areas of 
contemporary science fiction landscape, all hard and gray and martial and threatening. While in the workshops, the youngest writers are turning out frightened nuclear holocaust stories. Thus, in her own recent writing, Ursula has come back down to earth from the murderous stars. A recent project, Always Coming Home, is set in a far future Northern California land of her childhood, a loving evocation of earth, song, culture, and life. Small change is also, in its way, a slice of ancient history. A haunting, elegiac death and afterlife in the mode of classical Greece and uniquely in the mode of Ursula Le Guin. What is this? When is this collection from? Ha! 1986. It's a year younger than me. It's 38 years old. That's funny. Small change. My aunt said as I put the oboe on her tongue. I'll need more than that where I'm going. It's true, the change was very small. She looked exactly as she had looked a few hours before, except that she was not breathing. Goodbye, aunt, I said. I'm not going yet, she snapped. I always tried her patience. There are rooms in this house I've never even opened the door of. I did not know what she was talking about. Our house only has two rooms. This oval tastes funny, she said after a long silence. Where did you get it? I did not want to tell her that it was a good luck piece, a copper sequin, not money, though it was round like a coin, which I had carried for a year or more in my pocket ever since I picked it up by the gate of the brick maker's yard. I had rubbed it clean, of course, but my, my aunt had a keen tongue. And it was trodden mud, dog turds, brick dust, and the inside of my pocket she was tasting, along with the dry blood taste of copper. I pretended that I had not understood her question. I wonder you had it at all, my aunt said. If you have a penny in your pocket after a month without me, I'll be surprised. Poor thing. She would have sighed if she had been breathing. I had not known that she would continue to worry about me after she died. I began to cry. That's good, my aunt said with satisfaction. Just don't keep it up too long. I'm not going far now. I just want very much to find out what room that door leads to. She looked younger when she got up, younger than when she was w when I was born. She went across the room lightly and opened a door I had not known was there. I heard her say in a pleased, surprised voice, Lila. Lila was the name of her sister, my mother. For goodness sake, Lila, my aunt said, you haven't been waiting in here for 11 years. I could not hear what my mother said. I'm very sorry about leaving the girl, my aunt said. I did what I could, I tried my best. She's a good girl. But what will become of her now? My aunt never cried, and now she had no tears, but her anxiety made me cry again in alarm and self-pity. My mother came out of the new room in the form of a lace-wing fly and saw me crying. Tears taste salt to the living, but sweet to the dead. And they have a taste for sweets at first. I did not know all that then. I was just glad to have my mother with me, even as a tiny fly. It was a gladness the size of a fly. That was all there was left of my mother in the house, and she had got what she wanted, so my aunt went on. The room she was in was large and rather shadowy, lighted only by a skylight, like a storeroom. Along one wall stood distaffs full of spun flax in a row, and in a place where the light fell from the skylight stood a loom. 
My aunt had been a notable spinster and weaver all her life and was sorely tempted now by those rolls of fine, even thread, as well spun as any she had ever spun herself. The loom was warped and there lay a shuttle ready, but linen weaving is a careful art. If she began a shroud now, she would be at it for a long time. And much as she wanted a proper shroud, she had never been one to start a job and then drop it unfinished. So it was that she kept worrying about what would become of me. But she had already made up her mind to leave the housework undone, since housework is never done anyhow. And now she admitted that she must let other people see to her winding sheet. She hoped she could trust me to choose a clean sheet, at least, and a well-patched one. But she could not resist picking up the end thread of one of the distaffs and feeding out a length between her thumb and finger to test it for evenness and strength. And she kept the thread running between thumb and finger as she walked on. It was well that she did so, as the new room opened onto a corridor along which there were many doorways, each one leading to other halls and rooms, a maze in which she would certainly have lost her way but for the thread of flax. The rooms were clean, a little dusty and unfurnished. In one of them, my aunt found a toy lying on the floor, a wooden horse. It was crudely carved, the four legs all of a piece and the hind legs the same, a kind of two-legged horse with round, flat eyes, which she thought she remembered, though she was not sure. In another long, narrow room, many unused kitchen tools and pans lay on a counter, and three horn buttons in a row. At the end of a long corridor into which she was drawn by a gleam or a reflection at the far end, there stood an engine of some kind, which was certainly nothing my aunt had ever seen before. In one small room with no skylight, an intense, pungent smell hung in the air, filling up the room. Like a living creature caught in it. My aunt left that room hurriedly, upset. Though her curiosity had been roused by finding all these rooms she had not known in her house, her explorations and the silence brought on her a sense of oppression and unease. She stood for a moment outside the door of the room where the strong smell was making up her mind. That never took her long. She began to follow the thread back winding it up about the fingers of her left hand as she took it up. This process needed more attention than paying out. And lifting her eyes from a tangle in the thread, she was puzzled to find herself in a room which she did not recall passing through, but could hardly have crossed without noticing, for it is very large. The walls were of a beautiful fine grain stone of a pale gray hue in which certain figures like astrologers charts of the constellations, fine lines connecting stars or clusters of stars were inlaid in gold wire. The ceiling was light and high, the floor of worn dark marble. It was like a church, my aunt thought, but not a religious church, that is what she thought. The patterns on the walls were like the illustrations in books of learning, and the room itself was like the hall of a great library in the city. There were no books, but the place was majestic and reposeful, having about it a collected stillness very pleasant to the spirit of my aunt. She was tired of walking and decided to rest there.
She sat down, since there was no furniture, on the floor, in the corner nearest the door to which the thread had led her. My aunt was a woman who liked a wall at her back. The invasions had left her uneasy in open spaces, always looking over her shoulder. Though who could hurt her now? As she said to herself, sitting down. But as she said to herself, you never can be sure. The lines of gold wire on the walls led her eye along them as she sat resting. Some of the figures they made seemed familiar. She began to think that these figures or patterns were a map of the maze which she was in. The wires representing passages and the stars, rooms, or perhaps the stars represented the doors into rooms, the walls of which were not outlined. She could pretty certainly retrace the first corridor back to the room of the distaffs, but on the far side of that, where the old part of the house ought to be, the patterns continued looking a good deal more like the familiar constellations of the sky in early winter. She was not certain she understood the map at all, but she continued to study it, to let her mind follow the lines from star to star until she began to see her way. She got up then and went back, pursuing the flaxen thread and taking it up in her left hand till she came back. There I was in the same room, still crying. My mother was gone. Lacewing flies wait years to be born, but they only live a day. The undertaker's men were just leaving and I had to follow them. So my aunt came along to her funeral, though she did not want to leave the house. She tried to bring her ball of thread with her, but it broke as she crossed the threshold. I could hear her swear under her breath the way she always did when she broke a thread or spilled the sugar. Damn, and whispered. Neither of us enjoyed the funeral at all. My aunt grew panicky as they began to throw the dirt back into the grave. She cried aloud, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, which frightened me so much that I thought it was myself speaking, myself suffocating. And I fell down. People had to help me get up and to help me get home. I was so ashamed and confused among them that I lost my aunt. One of the neighbors who had never been particularly pleasant to us took pity on me and behaved with much kindness. She talked so wisely to me that I got up the courage to ask her, where is my aunt? Will she come back? But she did not know and only said things meant to comfort me. I am not as clever as most people, but I knew there was no comfort for me. The neighbor made sure I could look after myself, and that evening she sent one of her children over with dinner in a dish for me. I ate it and was very good. I had not eaten anything while my aunt was away in the other part of the house. At night, after dark, I lay down all alone in the bedroom. At first, I felt well and cheerful because of the food I had eaten, and I pretended my aunt was there sleeping in the same room, the way it had always been. Then I got frightened, and the fright grew in the darkness. My aunt came up out of the floor in the middle of the room. Red tiles humped up and cracked apart. Her hair and her head pushed through the tiles and then her body. She looked very dark like dirt and she was much smaller than she had been before. Let me be, she said. 
I was too terrified to speak. Let me go, my aunt said. But it was not truly my aunt. It was only an old part of her that had come back underground from the graveyard because I had been wanting her. I did not like that part of her or want it there. I cried, go away, go back, and hid my head in my arms. My aunt made a little creaking sound like a wicker basket. I kept my eyes hidden so long that I nearly fell asleep. When I looked, no one was there, or only a kind of darker place in the air, and the tiles were not cracked apart. I went to sleep. Next morning when I woke up, the sunlight was in the window and things were all right, but I could not walk across that part of the floor while my aunt had come up through the tiles. I was afraid to cry after that night since crying might bring her back to taste the sweetness or to scold me. But it was lonely in the house now that she had, was buried and gone. I had no idea what to do without her. The neighbor came in and talked about me finding work and gave me food again. But the next day a man came who said he had been sent by a creditor. He took away the chest of clothes and bedding. Later that day in the evening he came back because he had seen I was alone there. I kept the door locked this time. He spoke smoothly at first, trying to make me let him in. Then he began saying in a low voice that he would hurt me, but I kept the door locked and never answered. The next day somebody else came, but I had pushed the bedstead up against the door. It may have been the neighbor's child that came, but I was afraid to look. I felt safe staying in the back room. Other people came and knocked, but I never answered, and they went away again. I stayed in the back room until at last I saw the door my aunt had gone through. That day, I went and opened it. I was sure she would be there. But the room was empty. The loom was gone and the distaffs were gone and no one was there. I went on to the corridor beyond, but no further. I could never find my way by myself through all those halls and rooms or understand the patterns of the stars. I was so afraid and wretched that I went back and crawled into my own mouth and hid there. My aunt came to fetch me. She was very cross. I always tried her patience. All she said was, come on. And she pulled me along by the hand. Once she said, shame on you when we got to the river bank and looked me over very sternly. She washed my face with the dark water of that river and pressed my hair down with the palms of her hands. She said, I should have known. I'm sorry, aunt, I said. Oh, yes, she said, come along now, look sharp. For the boat had come across the river and was tying up at the wharf. We walked down to the wharf among the reeds in the twilight. It was after sunset. And there was no moon or stars and no wind blowing. The river was so wide I could not see the other shore. My aunt dickered with the ferryman. I let her do that since people always cheated me. She had taken the oval off her tongue and was talking fast. My niece, can't you see how it is? Of course they didn't give her the fare. She's not responsible. I came along with her to look after her. Here's the fare. Yes, it's for us both. No, you don't. And she drew back her hand, having merely shown him a glimpse 
of the bit of copper. It's not till we're both safe across. The ferryman glowered, but began to loosen the painter. Come along then, my aunt said. She stepped into the boat and held out her hand to me. So I followed her. There we go. That is the end of... Ah, uh, that is the end of small change. That story has been in my head a good 24 years now. do another shall we hello welcome thank you guys for joining i don't i'm you don't get to see any bobs okay i'm sorry you're gonna go bye bye now thank you <laughs> gracias alfredo Show bobs. Why don't you show me your bobs? Or maybe you have a Malcolm. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I was about to smash that guy myself. No quarter. Let's see, what do I have bookmarked here? Ooh, this is a good one. The region between Harlan Ellison. I'm not gonna read his backstory unless you guys really want me to. I'm gonna go right into the story this time. Ursula is just the goat, so I had to read you that. Yeah, Harlan Ellison. 1986. I think this is actually a rare book. Like, I think I haven't looked it up. You can tell I got it for $3 back in the day, y'all. And it has been put through some stuff. Design and Graphics by Jack Golgam. You know, I'm not surprised with him. I'm not surprised. This one, I mean, he was stuck in my head before I even knew who he was, you know? Because you can't just open up a book and see this and not be changed by it, in my opinion. Hi, Angel. That costs a lot of money. I'm sorry. You can't afford that. You can get a block for free, though. The region between. Left hand, the thin man said tonelessly, wrist up. William Bailey peeled back his cuff. The thin man put something cold against it. Nodded toward the nearest door. Through there, first slab on the right, he said and turned away. Just a minute, Bailey started. I wanted... Let's get going, buddy, the thin man said. That stuff is fast. Bailey felt something stab up under his heart. You mean you've already... That's all there is to it? That's what you came for, right? Slab one, friend, let's go. But I haven't been here two minutes. What do you expect? Organ music? Look, pal. The thin man shot a glance at the wall clock. I'm on my break, know what I mean? I thought I'd at least have time for, for, have a heart, chum. You make it under your own power. I don't have to haul you, see? The thin man was pushing open the door, urging Bailey through into an odor of chemicals and unlive flesh. In a narrow, curtained alcove, he indicated a padded cot. 
on your back, arms and legs straight out. Bailey assumed the position, tense as the thin man began fitting straps over his ankles. Relax. It's just if we get a little behind and I don't get back to a client for maybe a couple hours and they stiffen up, well, them issue boxes is just one size. You know what I mean? A wave of softness, warmness, swept over Bailey as he lay back. Hey, you didn't eat nothing for the last 12 hours. The thin man's face was hazy pink blur. I mm, Bailey heard himself say. Okay, sleep tight, face on. The thin man's voice boomed and faded. Bailey's last thought as the endless blackness closed in was of the words cut in the granite over the portal to the euthanasia center. Send me your tired, your poor, your hopeless, yearning to be free. To them I raise the lamp beside the brazen door. Death came merely as a hyphen. Life and the balance of the statement followed instantly. For it was only when Bailey died that he began to live. Yet, he could never have called it living. No one who had ever passed that way could have called it living. <laughs> it was something else. Something quite apart from death and something totally unlike life. Stars passed through him as he whirled outward, blazing and burning, carrying with them their planetary systems. Stars and more stars spun through him as though traveling down invisible wires into the dark behind and around him. Nothing touched him. They were as dust motes rushing silently past in incalculable pattern as Bailey's body grew larger, filled space in defiance of the law that said two bodies could not coexist in the same space at the same instant, greater than Earth, greater than its solar system, greater than the galaxy that contained it. Bailey's body swelled and grew and filled the universe from end to end and ballooned back on itself in a slightly flattened circle. His mind was everywhere. A string cheese pulled apart in filaments too thin to be measurable. Bailey's mind was there and there and there and there. It was also in the lens of the succubus. Murmuring tracery of golden light, a trembling moment of crystal sound. A note rising and trailing away infinitely high and followed by another superimposing in birth even as its predecessor died. The voice of a dream captured on spider webs. There locked in the heart of an amber perfection, Bailey was snared, caught, trapped, made permanent by a force that allowed his Baileyness to roam unimpeded anywhere and everywhere at the instant of death. Trapped in the lens of the succubus. Saludos. Waiting, empty. A mind snake on a desert world, frying under seven suns, poised in the instant of death. Its adversary, a 
buzz ball of cilia thin fibers sparking electrically moving toward the mind snake that a moment before had been set to strike and kill and eat. The mind snake immobile, empty of thought and empty of patterns of light that confounded its victims in the instance before the killing strike. The fuzzball sparked toward the mind snake, its fibers casting about across the vaporous desert. Picking up the mole sounds of things moving beneath the sand, tasting the air and feeling the heat as it pulsed in and away. It was improbable that a mind snake would spend all that light time luring and intriguing only at the penultimate moment to back off. No, not back off shut down, stop, halt entirely. But if this was not a trap, if this was not some new tactic, only recently learned by the ancient mind snake. Hmm. Then it had to be an opportunity for the fuzzball. It moved closer. The mind snake lay empty, waiting. Trapped in the lens of the succubus. Waiting, empty. A monstrous head, pale blue and veined, supported atop a swan neck by intricate latticework, yoke and halter. The senator from Nugal making his final appeal for the life of his world before the star court. Suddenly plunged into silence, no sound, no movement, the tall emaciated body propped on its seven league crutches. Only the trembling of balance, having nothing to do with life. Remember, remember, <laughs> reminding the assembled millions that an instant before this husk had contained a pleading eloquence. The fate of a world quivered in a balance no less precarious than that of the senator. What had happened? The amalgam of wild surmise that grew in the star court was scarcely less compelling than had been the original circumstances bringing Nogal to this place in the care of the words of this senator who now stood crutched, silent and empty, waiting, trapped in the lens of the succubus. Waiting, empty, the warlock of world. A power of darkness and evil, a force for chaos and destruction, poised above his runic symbols, his bits of awful, his animal bones, his stringy things without names, quick sudden gone to silence, eyes devoid of the pulverized starlight that was his sight, mouth abruptly slack in a face that had never known slackness. The ewe lamb lay still tied to the obsidian block, the graven knife with its unpleasant figures rampant still held in the numb hand of the warlock and the ceremony was halted. The forces of darkness had come in gathering, had come to their calls and now they roiled like milk, milk vapor in the air, unable to go, unable to do, loathe to abide while the warlock of Whirl, gone from his mind, stood frozen and empty, waiting, trapped in the lens of the succubus. Waiting, empty, a man on promontory, fifth planet out from the star Proxima, Proxima Centauri, halted in mid-step, on his way to a bank of controls, 
and a certain button hidden beneath three security plates. The, this man, this inestimably valuable kingpin in the machinery of war, struck dumb, struck blind, and a kind of death, not even waiting for another moment of time. Pulled out of himself by the gravity of non-being, an empty husk, a shell, a dormant thing, poised on the edges of their continents, two massed armies waiting for that button to be pushed and would never be pushed while this man, this empty and silent man, stood rooted in the sealed underworld bunker where precaution had placed him now inaccessible, now inviolate, now untouchable, this man and this war stalemated frozen. While the world around him struggled to move itself a fraction of a thought toward the future and found itself incapable, hamstrung, empty, waiting, trapped in the lens of the succubus. And waiting, empty, a subaltern, name of pink, lying on his bunk, contemplating the 50th assault mission, suddenly gone, drained, lifeless, neither dead nor alive. staring upward at the bulkhead ceiling of his quarters, while beyond his ship raged the Montauk Hill War, Sector 888 of the Galactic Index, somewhere between the Dark Star Montauk and the Nebula Cluster in the Thill Galaxy. Pink, limbo, lost and unfeeling, needing the infusion of a soul, the filling up of a life force. Pink needed in this war more than any other man, though the Phils did not know it until the moment his essence was stolen. Now Pink, lying there one shy of a fifty score of assault missions, but unable to aid his world, unable, undead, unalive, empty, waiting. While Bailey <laughs> floated in a region between, hummed in a nothingness as great as everywhere, without substance, without corporeality, pure thought, pure energy, pure Bailey trapped in the lens of the succubus. Chapter one and a half. More precious than gold. More sought after than uranium. More scarce than yin-yang blossoms. More needed than salvac. Rarer than diamonds. More valuable than force beads. More negotiable than the vampire extract. Dearer than a 2038 vintage Chateau Luxor. More lusted after than the twin vagina troll ops of Kanga. Souls. Thefts had begun in earnest. 500 years before. Random thefts. Stolen from the most improbable receptacles. From beasts and men and creatures who had never been thought to possess souls. Who was stealing them was never known. Far house somewhere in reaches of space, or not space, or the interstices between space and not space, that had no names, had no dimensions, whose light had never even reached the outmost thin edge of known space. There lived or existed or were creatures or things or entities or forces, someone who needed the life force 
of the creepers and walkers and lungers and swimmers and flyers who inhabited the known universes. Souls vanished and the empty husks remained. Thieves, they were called, for no other name applied so well, bore in its single syllable such sadness and sense of resignation. They were called thieves and they were never seen, were not understood, had never given a clue to their nature or their purpose or even their method of theft. And so nothing could be done about their depredations. They were as death, handiwork observed, but a fact of life without recourse to higher authority. Death and the thieves were final in what they did. So the known universes, the star court and the galactic index and the universal meridian and the Perseus Confederacy and the crab complex shouldered the reality of what the thieves did with resignation and stoicism. No other course was open to them. They could do no other. But it changed life in the known universes. It brought about the existence of soul recruiters who pandered to the needs of the million, billion, trillion worlds, Shanghaiers, gray robbers of creatures not yet dead. In their way, thieves, even as thieves, beings whose dark powers and abilities enabled them to fill the tables of organization of any world with fresh souls from worlds that did not even su suspect they existed, much less the court, the index, the meridian, the confederacy, or the complex. If a key figure on the fringe world suddenly went limp and soulless, one of the soul recruiters was contacted and the black traffic was engaged in. Last resort, final contact, most reprehensible but expeditious necessity. They stole and supplied. One such was the succubus. He was gold and he was dry. These were the only two qualities possessed by the succubus that could be explicated in human terms. He had once been a member of the dominant race that skimmed across the sand seas of a tiny planet, fifth from the star sun labeled Kapil 112 in Cain's Venatici. He had long since ceased to be anything so simply identified. The path he had taken, light years long and several hundred Terran years long, had brought him from the sand seas and a minimum of face. The only term that could even approximate one of the measures of wealth his race valued. To a cove of goldness and dryness near the hub of the crab complex. His personal worthiness could now only be measured in terms of hundreds of billions of dollars, unquenchable light sufficient to sustain his offspring unto the 9,000th generation, a name that could only be spoken aloud or in movement by the upper three social sects of the Confederacy races, more face than any other member of his race had ever possessed, more even than that held in myth by Yale. Gold, dry, and inestimably worthy, the succubus. Though his trade was one publicly deplored, there were only seven entities in the known universes who were aware that the succubus was a soul recruiter. He kept his two lives forcibly separated. Face and grave robbing were not compatible. He ran a tidy business, small with enormous returns. 
special souls selected carefully. No seconds. No hand-me-downs. Quality stock. And through the seven highly placed entities who knew him, Nin, Fondan, Enek El, Mili Baskodal, A Plane Without a Name, Cam Royale, and Pl, he was channeled only the loftiest commissions. He had supplied souls of all sorts in the 500 years he had been recruiting, into the empty husk of a master actor on Bolyal V, into the waiting body of a creature that resembled a plant aphid, the figurehead of a coalition labor movement on Wheelchit 11 and Wheelchit 13, into the unmoving form of the sole empty daughter of the hereditary ruler of Golina Prime, into the untenanted shape of an arcane magist scientist on Donadello's third seventh moon enabling the 500 Zodjam religious cycle to progress. Into the lusterless spark of light that sealed the tragic Lacolinist group mind of Arachnan's dispassionate bell-silver dichotomy. Not even the seven who functioned as go-betweens for the succubus commissions knew where and how he obtained such fine, raw, unsolidified souls. His competitors dealt almost exclusively in the atrophied, crustaceous souls of beings whose thoughts and beliefs and ideologies were so ingrained that the souls came into their new receptacles already stained and imprinted. But the succubus cleverly contrived, youthful souls, hardy souls, plastic and ready to assimilate souls, lustrous, inventive souls, the finest souls in the known universe. The succubus, as determined to excel in his chosen profession as he was to amass face, had spent the better part of 60 years roaming the outermost fringes of the known universe. He had carefully observed many races, noting for his purpose only those that seemed malleable, pliant, far removed from rigidity. He had selected for his purpose the Stichi Amasani, Cocoloids, Flashers, Dristonics, Bonnetnits, Condolis, tra Travisi, and Humans. On each planet where these races dominated, he put into effect subtle recruiting systems, wholly congruent with the societies in which they appeared. The Stichi were given Eterna Dream Dust. The Amasani were given doppelganger shifting. The Kokoloids were given the cult of rebirth. The Flashers were given proof of the hereafter. The Gristeniks are given ritual mesmeric trances. The Bernanits were given imperfect teleportation. The Condolese were given entertainment called Trial by Nightmare Combat. The Tratavisi were given an underworld motivated by high incentives for kidnapping and mind blotting. They were also given a wondrous narcotic called Not a Bit. And the humans were given euthanasia centers. And from these diverse channels, the succubus received a steady supply of prime souls. He received flashers and skimmers and condolese and ether breathers and amasani and perambulators and burninets and gill creatures and William Bailey. Chapter one and three quarters. Trapped 
in the lens of the succubus. Buenas noches. Bailey, cosmic nothingness, electrical potential, spread out to the ends of the universe and beyond, nubbined his thoughts. Dead, of that no doubt, dead and gone, back on earth, lying cold and faintly blue on a slab in the euthanasia center. Toes turned up, eyeballs rolled up in their sockets, rigid and gone. And yet alive, more completely alive than he had ever been, than any human being had ever conceived of being. Alive with all of the universe, one with the clamoring stars, brother to the infinite empty spaces, heroic in proportions that even myth cannot define. He knew everything, everything there had ever been to know, everything that was, everything that would be. Past, present, future, all were merged and met in him. He was on the feeder line to the succubus, waiting to be collected, waiting to be tagged and filed, even as his alabaster body back on earth would be tagged and filed, waiting to be cross-indexed and shunted off to a waiting empty husk on some far world. All this he knew, but one thing separated him from the millions of souls that had gone before him. He didn't want to go. Infinitely wise, knowing all, Bailey knew every other soul that had gone before had been resigned with soft acceptance to what was to come. It was a new life, a new voyage in another body, and all the others had been fired with curiosity, unveiled by strangeness, wonderstruck with being as big as the known universe and going somewhere else. But not Bailey. He was rebellious. He was fired by hatred of the succubus. Inveigled. Inveigled? I don't even know what that word is. Inveigled by thoughts of destroying him and his feeder lines. Wonderstruck with being the only one, the only one who had ever thought of revenge. He was somehow strangely not tuned in with being rebodied as all the others had been. Why am I different? He wondered. And of all the things he knew, he did not know the answer to that. Inverting negatively, atoms expanded to the size of whole galaxies, stretched out membrane, osmotically breathing whole star systems, inhaling blue-white stars and exhaling quasars, Bailey, the known universe, asked himself yet another question, even more important. Do I want to do something about it? <laughs> Passing through a zone of infinite cold, the world came back to him from his own mind in chill icicles of thought. <laughs> yes. And born on comments, plunging frenziedly through his cosmic body, altering course suddenly and traveling at right angles in defiance of every natural law he had known when alive. The inevitable question responding to a yes asked itself, why should I? Life for Bailey on Earth had been pointless. He had been a man who did not fit. He had been a man driven to the suicide chamber literally by disorientation and frustration. frustration. I was called to the office of the social director of my residence's block. Frankly, I was frightened. I knew I hadn't done anything to be afraid about it. But ever since I'd been a child, ever since I'd been called to the office of the school principal, just being summoned had made my gut tight. 
had made me feel like I wanted to go to the bathroom. He had made me wait half an hour on a bench. Damn him. With a gaggle of weirdos who looked like they didn't hadn't had their heads scrubbed and customized in seven months. Finally, the box called my name and I dropped to his office. He was sitting in one of those informal conversation groupings of chairs and coffee table that instantly put me off. Mr. Bailey, he, he said, smiled. Hardy bastard. I walked over and sat down even before he suggested I sit. He didn't drop the smile for a second. He was up to anything. Why don't we get right to it, he said. I smiled back at him, but I felt trapped, really hemmed in. I've been looking at your tag chart, Mr. Bailey, and, well, I hesitate to make any jump conclusions here, but it appears you've been neglecting your relaxation period. Damn him. Damn him. I see here during the month of September that you worked overtime at least, what is it, uh, 11 hours? Is there a law against that? Oh, no, no, of course not. It just seems to us here at the block that you're perhaps uh, overdoing it a bit. Working. Yes, working. Has my block steward complained? Has my EEG been erratic? Am I being accused of something? No, of course not. My lord, man, there's no need to be so defensive. We're only trying to find out if something is, well, disturbing you. If I had been able to, I'd have killed that son of a bitch right there and then and there in his conversation grouping. It would have made fine conversation for his office staff. Come in and find him brain to death with his own coffee urn. Nothing's disturbing me. Then you'll pardon me if I feel it apropos to ask you why you aren't taking your proper relaxation periods, Mr. Bailey. I feel like keeping busy. Ah, but all work and no play. The omnipresent melancholy that had consumed him on earth bursting with overpopulation was something to which he had no desire to return. Then why this frenzy to resist being shunted into the body of a creature undoubtedly living a life more demanding, more exciting, anything had to be better than what he'd come from, more alive? Why this fantastic need to track back along the feeder lines to the succubus, to destroy the one who had saved him from oblivion? Why this need to destroy a creature who was merely fulfilling a necessary operation of balance in a universe singularly devoid of balance? In that thought lay the answer, but he did not have the key. He turned off his thoughts. He was Bailey no more. And in that instant, the succubus pulled his soul from the file and sent it to where it was needed. He was certainly Bailey no more. Chapter two. Subaltern Pink squirmed on his spike palette and opened his eye. His back was stiff. He turned, letting the invigorating short spikes tickle his flesh through the heavy mat of fur. His mouth felt dry and loamy. It was the morning of his 50th assault mission. Or was it? He seemed to remember lying down for a night's sleep and then a very long dream without substance. It had been all black and empty. Hardly something the organizer would have programmed. It must have malfunctioned. He slid sideways on the spike pallet and dropped his enormous furred legs over the side. As his paws touched the tiles, a whirring from the wall preceded the toilet's facility's appearance. It swiveled into view and Pink looked at himself in the full-length mirror. He looked all right. Dream. Bad dream. 
The huge bear-like subaltern shoved off the bed, stood to his full seven feet, and lumbered into the duster. The soothing powders cleansed away his sleep fatigue, and he emerged, blue pelt glistening, with bad dreams almost entirely dusted away. Almost entirely. He had a lingering feeling of having been somewhat larger. The briefing colors washed across the walls and pink hurriedly attached his ribbons. It was informal wear today. Three yellows, three ochres, three whites, and an ego blue. He went down tunnel to the briefing section and prayed. All around him, his sorty partners were on their backs, staring up at the sky dome and the random programmed patterns of stars in their religious significances. Montag's Lord of Propriety had programmed success for today's mission. The stars swirled and shaped themselves, and the portents were reassuring to Pink and his fellows. The Montag Thill War had been raging for almost 100 years and seemed close to ending. The star, the dark star Montag and the nebula cluster in Thil Galaxy had thrown their might against each other for a century. The people themselves were weary of war. It would end soon. One or the other would make a mistake. The opponent would take the advantage, and the strike toward peace would follow immediately. It was merely a matter of time. The assault troops, especially Pink, a planetary hero, were suffused with a feeling of importance, a sense of their relevance of what they were doing. Out to kill, certainly, but with the sure knowledge that they were working towards a worthwhile goal. Through death to life. The portents had told them again and again these last months that this was the case. The sky dome turned golden and the stars vanished. The assault troops sat up on the floor, awaited their briefing. It was Pink's 50th mission. His great yellow eye looked around the briefing room. There were more young troopers in this mission. In fact, he was the only veteran. It seemed strange. Could Montag's Lord of Propriety have planned it this way? But where were Andak and Melnak and Gorek? They had been here yesterday. Was it just yesterday? He had a strange memory of having been asleep, away, unconscious. What, something else? As though more than one day had passed since his last mission. He leaned across to the young trooper on his right and placed a paw flat on the other. What day is today? The trooper flexed palm and answered with a note of curiosity in his voice. It's former, the ninth. Pink was startled. What cycle? He asked, almost afraid to hear the answer. Third, the young trooper said. The briefing officer entered at that moment, and Pink had no time to marvel that it was not the next day, but a full cycle later. Where had the days gone? What had happened to him? Had Gorik and the others been lost in sorties? Had he been wounded, sent to repair, only now been remanded to duty? Had he been wounded and suffered amnesia? He remembered a lance corporal in the throbbing battalion who had been seared and lost his memory. They had sent him back to Montauk, where he had been blessed by the Lord of Propriety himself. What had happened to him? Strange memories, not his own, all the wrong colors, weights, and tones, wholly alien, kept pressing against the bones in his forehead. He was listening to the briefing officer, but also hearing an undertone, another voice entirely coming from 
some other place he could not locate. You great ugly fur thing, you. Wake up. Look around you. One hundred years slaughtering. Why can't you see what's being done to you? How dumb can you be, the lords of propriety? They set you up. Yeah, you. Pink, listen to me. You can't block me out. You'll hear me. Bailey. You're the one, Pink. The special one. They trained you for what's coming up. No, don't block me out, you imbecile. Don't block me. I'll be here. You can't block me out. The background noise went on, but he would not listen. It was sacrilegious. Saying things about the Lord of Propriety. Even the Phil Lord of Propriety was sacrosanct in Pink's mind. Even though they were at war, the two lords were eternally locked together in holiness. To blaspheme even the enemy's lord was unthinkable. Yet he had thought it. He shuddered with the enormity of what had passed in his thoughts and knew he could never go to release and speak of it. He would submerge the memory and pay strict attention to the briefing officer who was. This cycle's mission is a straightforward one. You will be under the direct linkage of subaltern Pink, whose reputation is known to you all. Pink inclined with the humbleness movement. You will drive directly into the Phil Labyrinth chivy and harass the path to the ground world where where and there level as many targets of opportunity as you were able before you're destroyed after this briefing you will reassemble with your sortie leaders and fully familiarize yourself with the target cubes the lord has commanded to be constructed he paused and stared directly at pink his golden eye gone to pinkness with age and dissipation but what he said was for all the sappers. There is one target you will not strike at. It is the maze of the Phil Lord of Propriety. This is ir irrevocable. You will not, repeat not, strike near the maze of the Lord. Pink felt a leap of pleasure. This was the final strike. It was the preamble to peace, a suicide mission. He ran 11 thankfulness prayers through his mind. It was the dawn of a new day for Montag and Phil. The lords of propriety were good. The lords held all cupped in their holiness. Yet, he had thought the unthinkable. You will be under the direct linkage of subaltern Pink, the briefing officer said again. Then, kneeling and passing down the rows of sappers, he palmed good death with honor to each of them. When he reached Pink, he stared at him balefully for a long instant and as though wanting to speak. But the moment passed. He rose and left the chamber. They went into small groups with the sortie leaders and examined the target cubes. Pink went directly to the briefing officer's cubicle and waited patiently until the older Montagosque's prayers were completed. When his eye cleared, he stared at Pink. A path through the labyrinth has been cleared. What will we be using? Reclaimed sortie craft. They have all been outfitted with diversionary equipment. Linkage level? They tell me a high six. They tell you. He regretted the tone even as he spoke. The briefing officer looked surprised, as if his desk had coughed. He did not speak, but stared at Pink with the same baleful stare the subaltern had seen before. Recite your catechism, the briefing officer said finally. Pink settled back slowly on his haunches, ponderous weight drop, down dropping with grace. Then, free flowing, free flowing, all flows. 
from the Lord's all free, all fullness flowing from the Lord's. What will I do? What will I do? What will I do without my Lord's? Honor in the dying, rest in the honor, all honor. From the Lord's all rest, all honoring. To honor my Lord, this I will do, this I will do. I will live when I die for my Lord. And it was between the first and second sacredness that the darkness came to pink. He saw the briefing officer come toward him, reach a great palm toward him, and there was darkness. The same sort of darkness from which he had risen in his own cubicle before the briefing, yet not the same. That darkness had been total, endless, with the feeling that he was somehow larger, greater, as big as all space. And... This darkness was like being turned off. He could not think. He could not even think that he was unthinking. He was cold and simply not there. Simply not there. Then, as if it had not happened, he was back in the briefing officer's cubicle. The great bear-like shape was moving back from him, and he was reciting the second sacredness of his catechism. What had happened, he did not know. Here are your course coordinates, the briefing officer said. He extracted the spool from his pouch and gave it to Pink. The subaltern marveled again at how old the briefing officer must be. The hair of his chest pouch was almost gray. Sir, Pink began, then stopped. The briefing officer raised a palm. I understand, subaltern. Even to the most reverent among us, there come moments of confusion. Pink smiled. He did understand. Lords, Pink said, palming the briefing officer with fullness and propriety. Lords, he replied, palming honor in the dying. Pink left the briefing officer's cubicle and went to his own place. As soon as he was certain the subaltern was gone, the briefing officer, who was very old, linked up with someone else far away and told him things. First, they melted the gelatin around him. It was hardly gelatin, but it had come to be called gel by the sappers, and the word had stuck. As the gelatin stuck, face protected, he lay in the ten troughs, in sequence, getting the gelatinous substance melted around him. Finally, pincers that had been carefully padded lifted him from the tenth trough and slid him along to the track to his sortie craft. Once inside, the pilot country stretched out on his stomach. He felt the 200 wires insert themselves into the gel, into the fur, into his body. The brain wires were the last to fix. As each wire hissed from its spool and locked into the skull contacts, Pink felt himself go a little more into integration with the craft. At last, the final wire tipped on icily, and so pink was metal flesh, bulkhead skin, eye scanners, bone rivets, plastic cartilage, artery, ventricle, capacitors, molecules, transistors, beast craft, beast craft, beast craft, I. All of him as one, totality, metal man, furred vessel, essence of mechanism, soul of inanimate, life in force drive, linkage of mind with power plant. Pink the ship, sortie craft 90 named Pink, and the others linked to him. 70 sappers, each encased in gel, each wired up, each a mind to its sortie craft. Seventy linked in telepathically with Pink. 
and pink linked in with his own craft and all of them instrumentalities of the Lord of Propriety. The great carrier wing that bore them made escape orbit and winked out of normal space. Here, not here. In an instant gone. Gone where? Inverse space. Through the gully of inverse space to wink into existence once again on the outermost edge of the Thill Labyrinth. Here, not here. Confronting a fortified tundra of space crisscrossed by deadly lines of force, a cosmic fireworks display, a cat's cradle of vanishing, appearing and disappearing threads of a million colors, each one receptive to all the others. Cross one, break one, interpose. And suddenly, uncountable others hone in, deadly ones, seeking ones, stunners and drainers and leakers and burners. The Phil Labyrinth. Seventy-one sortie craft hung quivering, the last of the inverse space coronas, trembling off and gone. Through the tracery of force lines, the million stars of the Thill galaxy burned with the quiet reserve of ice crystals. And there in the center, the nebula cluster. And there in the center of the cluster, ground world. Link in with me. Pink's command fled and found them. Seventy beast craft taste sounds sense touches came back to Pink. His sappers were linked in. A path has been cleared through the labyrinth for us. Follow and trust. Honor. In the dying came back the response from the 70 minds of flesh and metal. Honor in the dying. They moved forward. Strung out like fish of metal with minds linked by thought, they surged forward with the lead craft into the labyrinth. Color burned and boiled past, silently sizzling the vacuum. Pink detected murmurs of panics, quelled them with a dampening thought of his own. Images of the still pools of Dunsidere, of deep sighs after a full meal, of Lord worship during the days of first fullness, trembling back to him, their minds quieted. And the color beams whipped past on all sides without up or down or distance, but never touching them. Time had no meaning. Fused into the flesh metal, the sortie craft followed the secret path that had been cleared for them through the impenetrable labyrinth. Pink had one vagrant thought. Who cleared this for us? And a voice from somewhere far away, a voice that was his own yet someone else's, the voice of someone who called himself a Bailey, said, that's it. Keep thinking what they don't want you to think. But he put the thoughts from him, and time was wearied itself and succumbed, and finally they were there. In the exact heart of the nebula cluster in Phil Galaxy. Ground world lay fifth from the source star, and home sun that had nurtured the powerful Phil rays till it could explode outward. Link in to the sixth power, Pink commanded. They linked. He spent some moments reinforcing his command splices, making the intersheaths foolproof and trigger responsive. Then he made a prayer and they went in. Why am I locking them in so close? Pink wondered, dampening the thought before it could pass along the lines to his sappers. What am I trying to conceal? Why do I need such repressive control? 
What am I trying to avert? Pink's skull thundered with sudden pain. Two minds were at war in inside him. He knew that. He suddenly knew it. Who is that? It's me, you clown. Get out. I'm on a mission. It's important. It's a fraud. They program. Get out of my head. Listen to me, you idiot. I'm trying to tell you something. You need to know. I won't listen. I'll override you, I'll block you, I'll damp you. No, listen, don't do that. I've been someplace you haven't been and I can tell you all about the Lords. Oh, this can't be happening to me, not right now. I'm devout, man. Fuck that garbage. Listen, they lost you, man. They lost you to a soul stealer and they had to get you back because you were their specially programmed killer and they want you to, Lord, oh Lord of propriety, hear me now. Hear me now, your most devout worshiper. Forgive these blasphemous thoughts. I can't control you anymore, you idiot. I'm fading, fading, fading. Lord, oh Lord, hear me. I wish only to serve you, only to suffer the honor in the dying. Peace through death. I am the instrumentality of the Lord. I know what I must do. That's what I'm trying to tell you. And then he was gone in the mire at the bottom of Pink's mind. They were going in. They came down, straight down past the seven moons, broke the cloud cover, leveled out in a delta wing formation and streaked toward the larger of the two continents that formed 90% of ground world's landmass. Pink kept them at super supersonic speed, blurring, and drove a thought out to his sappers. We'll drop straight down below a thousand feet and give them the shockwave. Hold back till I tell you to level off. They were passing over a string of islands. Causeway linked beads in a pea green sea, each one covered from shore to shore with teeming housing dorms that commuted their residents to the main continents and the complexes of high rise bureaucratic towers. Dive, Pink ordered. The formation angled sharply forward as though it was hung on puppet strings, then fell straight down. The metal flesh of Pink's ship began to heat. Overlapping armadillo plates groan. Pink pushed their speed. Four speed mountings lubricated themselves, went dry, lubricated again. They dropped down. Follicle thin fissures were grooved in the bubble surfaces. Sappers began to register fear. Pink locked them tighter. Instruments coded off the far right and refused to register. The island chain flew up toward them. Pressure in the gelatin trough flattened them with G's. Now there was enough atmosphere to scream past their sortie craft and it whistled, trilled, howled, built and climbed. Gimbal tracks rasped in their mountings. Down and down they plunged, seemingly bent on, thundering into the islands of ground world. Sir, sir, hold steady, not yet, not yet, I'll tell you when, not yet. Pushing an enormous bubble of pressurized air before them, the delta wing formations wailed straight down towards the speck of islands that became dots, became buttons, became masses, became everything as they rushed up and filled the bubble sites from side to side. Level out now. Do it. Do it. Level now. And they pulled out, leveled off, and shot away. The bubble of air, enormous, solid as an asteroid, thundering down unchecked, hit, struck, burst broke with devastating results. Pink's sortie craft plunged away and in their wake they left exploding cities, great structures erupting, others trembling, shuddering, then caving in on themselves. 
the shockwave hit and spread outward from shore to shore. Mountains of plasteel and lathite volcanoed in blossoms of flame and flesh. The blast pit created by the air bubble struck to the core of the island chain. A tidal wave rose like some prehistoric leviathan and boiled over one entire spot of land. Another island broke up and sank almost at once. Fire and walls and plasteel crushed and destroyed after the shock wave. The residents' islands were leveled as Pink's sortie craft vanished over the horizon, still traveling at supersonic speed. They passed beyond the island chain, leaving in their wake dust and death, death and ruin, ruin and fire. Through death to peace, Pink sent honor they responded as one far away on ground world a traitor smiled in a maze a lord sat with antenna twined waiting flesh and metal eased in ruins a baby whose exoskeleton had been crushed crawled toward the pulsing innards of its mother Seven moons swung in their orbits. A briefing officer on Montauk knew it was full, golden. O oh Lord, what I have done, I have done for you. Wake up. Will you wake up, Pink? The mission is... The other thing, the Bailey was wrenching at him, poking its head up out of the slime. He thrust it back down firmly and made a prayer. Sir, the thought of one of his sappers came back along the intersheet inter line. Did you say something? Nothing, Pink said. Keep in formation. He locked them in even tighter, screwing them down with mental shackles till they gasped. The pressure was building. A six power link up and the pressure was building. I am a hero, Pink thought. I can do it. Then they were flashing across the great ocean and it blurred into an endless carpet of thick heaving green. Pink felt sick watching it whip by beneath him. He went deeper into ship and the vessel felt no sickness. He fed the stability of nausea submerged along the interstices. They were met by the thill inner defense lines over empty ocean. First came the sea breathers, but they fell short when Pink ordered his covey to lift for 3,000 feet. They leveled off just as the beaks swooped down in their land-to-sea parabolas. Two of them snouted and perceived the range, even as they were viciously beamed into their component parts by Pink's uttermost sappers. But they'd already fed back the trajectories, and suddenly the sky above them was black, with the black metal bodies of beaks flapping, dropping, squalling as they cascaded into the center of the formation. Pink felt sappers vanish from the link up and fed the unused power along other lines, pulling the survivors tighter under his control. Form a sweep, he commanded. The formation regrouped and rolled in a graceful gullwing maneuver that brought them craft to craft in a fan. Plus, Pink ordered, cutting in with a thought, the imploding beam. The beams of each sortie craft fanned out, overlapping, making an impenetrable wall of deadly force. The beaks came whirling back and careened across the formation's path. Creatures of metal and mindlessness, wheels and carapaces, blackness and berserk rage, hundreds, entire eeries. When they struck the soft pink fan of the overlapping implosion beams, they woofed in on themselves, dropped instantly. 
the formation surged forward. Then they were over the main continent. Rising from the exact center was the gigantic mountain atop which the Lord, the Phil Lord of Propriety, lived in his maze. Attack! Targets of opportunity. Pink commanded, sending impelling power along the line, along the link up. His metal hide itched. His eyeball sensors watered. In they went again. Do not strike at the Lord's maze, one of the sappers thought. And Pink threw up a wall of thought that drew the thought off the link up so it did not reach the other sappers, but hit the wall and broke like foam. Do not strike at the Lord's maze. Oh. Why did I do that? We were brief not to attack the Lord's maze. It would be unthinkable to attack the Lord's maze. It would be it would precipitate even greater war than before. The war would never end. Why did I stop my sapper from reiterating that order? And why haven't I told them not to do it? It was stressed at the briefing. They're linked in so very tightly. They'd obey in a moment anything I said. What is happening? I'm heading for the mountain. Lord! Listen to me, Pink. This war has been maintained by the Lords of Propriety for a hundred years. Why do you think it was made heresy even to think negatively about the opposing Lord? They keep it going to feed off it. Whatever they are, these Lords, they come from the same pocket universe and they live off the energy of men at war. They must keep the war going or they'll die. They programmed you to be their secret weapon. The war was reaching a stage where both Montag and Phil want peace and the Lords can't have that. Whatever they are, Pink, whatever kind of creature they are, wherever they come from, for over a hundred years, They've held your two galaxies in their hands, and they've used you. The Lord isn't in his maze, Pink. He's safe somewhere else, but they planned it between them. They knew if a Montagask sortie penetrated the ground world and struck the maze, it would keep the war going indefinitely. So they programmed you, Pink. But before they could use you, your soul was stolen. They put my soul in you, a man of Earth, Pink. You don't even know where Earth is, but my name is Bailey. I've been trying to reach through to you. But you always shut me out. They had you programmed too well. But with the link-up pressure, you don't have the strength to keep me out. And I've got to let you know your program to strike the maze. You can't stop it. You can stop it, Pink. You can avoid it all. You can end the war. You have it within your power, Pink. Don't strike the maze. I'll redirect you. Strike where the lords are hiding. You can rid your galaxies of them, Pink. Don't let them kill you. Who do you think arranged for the path through the labyrinth? Why do you think there wasn't more effective resistance? They wanted you to get through, to commit the one crime they could not forgive.
The words reverberated in Pink's head as the sortie craft followed him on a tight wedge, straight for the maze of the Lord. I, no, I... Pink could not force thoughts out to his sappers. He would snap shut. His mind was aching, the sound of straining and creaking, the buildings on the island chain ready to crumble. Bailey inside, Pink inside. The programming of the Lord's inside all of them pulling at the fiber of pink's mind for an instant the programming took precedence new directives override previous orders follow me in they dove straight for the maze no pink fight it fight it and pull out i'll show you where they're hiding you can end this war the programming phasing was interrupted. Pink abruptly opened his great golden eye. His mind sinked in even more tightly with his ship. And at that instant, he knew the voice in his head was telling him the truth. He remembered. Remembered the endless sessions. Remembered the conditioning. Remembered the programming. Knew he had been duped knew he was not a hero, knew he had to pull out of the dive, knew that at last he could bring peace to both galaxies. He started to think, pull out, override, and fire it down the remaining link-up interstices. The, and the lords of propriety, who left very little to chance, who had followed Pink all the way, contacted the succubus. complained of the merchandise they had bought, demanded it be returned. Bailey's soul was wrenched from the body of pink. The subaltern's body went rigid inside its gel trough, and soulless, empty, rigid, the sortie craft plunged into the mountaintop where the empty maze stood. It, followed, it was followed by the rest of the sortie craft. The mountain itself erupted in a geysering pillar of flame and rock and plasteel. One hundred years of war was only the beginning. Somewhere hidden, the Lords of Propriety, umbilicious, um, umbilicus joined with delight, shocks spurting softly pink along the flesh linkage joining them, began their renewed gluttonous feeding. Chapter 4 Bailey was whirled out of the Montagasque subaltern's body. His soul went shooting away on an asymptotic curve back along the feeder lines to the soul files of the succubus. This is what it was like to be in the soul station, round, weighted with the scent of grass, perilous in that the music was dynamically contracting. Souls had occasionally become too enriched and had gone flat and flaccid. There was a great deal of white space. Nothing was ranked, therefore nothing could be found in the same place twice. Yet it didn't matter. For the succubus had only to focus his lens and the item trembled into special awareness. Bailey spent perhaps 12 minutes reliving himself as a collapsing star, then revolved his interfaces and masturbated as Anne Boleyn. He savored mint where it smells most poignant, from deep in the shallow earth through the roots of the plant, then extended himself, extruded himself through an ice crystal and lit the far massif of the highest mountain on an onyx asteroid, recreating the Last Supper in Chiaroscuro. 
He burned for 1,700 years as the illuminated letter B on the first stanza of a forbidden enchantment in a papyrus volume used to summon up the imp James Fenimore Cooper, then stood outside himself and considered his eyes and their 100,000 B facets. He allowed himself to be born from the womb of a tree sloth and flickered into rain that deluged a planet of coal for 10,000 years. And he beamed and he sorrowed. Bailey, all Bailey, soul once more, free as all the universes threw himself toward the farthermost edge of the slightly flattened parabola that comprised the dark. He filled the dark with deeper darkness and bathed in fountains of brown wildflowers. Circles of coruscating violets streamed from his fingertips, from the tip of his nose, from his genitals, from the tiniest fibrillating fibers of hair that coated him. He shed water and hummed. Then the succubus drew him beneath the lens, and Bailey was sent out once more. Waste not, want not. Six. He was just under a foot tall. He was covered with blue fur. He had a ring of eyes that circled his head. He had eight legs. He smelled of fish. He was low to the ground and he moved very fast. He was a stalker cat. And he was first off the survey ship on Belial. Belial. Oh, that's an interesting choice of name. First off the sentry ship. survey ship. The others followed, but not too soon. They always waited for the cat to do its work. It was safer that way. The Thelone had found out that in 10,000 years of exploring the universe, the cats did the first work, then the Filioni did theirs. It was the best way to rule the universe. Belial was a forest world covered in long continents that ran from pole to pole with feather top trees. It was ripe for discovery. Bailey looked out of his 30 eyes, seeing around himself in a full 360 degree spectrum, seeing all the way up into the ultraviolet, seeing all the way down into the infra infrared. The forest was silent, absolutely no sound. Bailey the cat would have heard a sound had there been a sound, but there was no sound. No birds, no insects, no animals, not even the whispering of the feather top trees as they struggled toward the bright, hot white sun. It was incredibly silent. Bailey said so. The Filoni, Filoni went to went to a condition red. No world is silent, and a forest world is always noisy. But this one was silent. They were out there waiting, watching the great ship and the small stalker cat that had emerged from it. Who they were, the cat and the Filioni did not know. But they were there, and they were waiting for the invaders to make the first move. The stalker cat glided forward. <laughs> Hi, WT. It is live. Yes, it's uh, it's the Bible. <laughs> Bailey felt presences deep in the forest, deeper than he knew he could prowl with impunity. They were there, watching him as he moved forward. But he was a cat, and if he was to get his fish, he would work. The Filioni were watching them 
in there, back in the trees, they were watching. It's a, a bad life, he thought. The life of a cat is a nasty, dirty, bad one. Bailey was not the first cat to have thought that thought. It was the litany of the stalker cats. They knew their place, had always known it, but that was the way it was. It was the way it had always been. The Filioni ruled and the cats worked and the universe became theirs. Yet it wasn't shared. It was the Filioni universe and the stalker cats were hired help. It's a joke, David. <laughs> it's a joke. Welcome everybody. Thank you for the likes. We are um, we are in the middle of a short story, The Region Between by Harlan Ellison. The fine mesh cap that covered the top and back of the cat's head glowed with a faint but discernible halo. The sunbeams through which he passed caught the gold filaments of the cat's sparkling radiations back towards the ship. Oh, something happened. Hiccup in the live there. The sunbeams through which he passed caught at the gold filaments of the cap and sent sparkling radiations back towards the ship. The ship stood in the center of the blasted area it had cleared for its prime base. Inside the ship, the team of Filioni ecologists sat in front of the many process screens and saw through the eyes of the stalker cat. They murmured to one another at first, then another then another saw something of interest cat lad one of them said softly still no sound nothing yet brewer but i can feel them watching one of the other ecologists leaned forward the entire wall behind the hundred screens was a pulsing membrane speak into it at any point and the cat's helmet picked up the voice carried it to the stalker Tell me, lad, what does it feel like? Oh, don't give away all my, uh, all of my information. <clears throat> I'm not sh quite sure, kicker. I'm getting it mixed. It feels like the eyes staring and wood and sap. And yet there's mobility. It can't be the trees. You're sure? As best I can tell right now, Kicker, I'm going to go into the forest and see. Good luck, lad. Thank you, driver. How is your goiter? I'm fine, lad. Take care. The stalker cat padded carefully to the edge of the forest. Sunlight slanted through the feather tops onto the gloom. It was cool and dim inside there. Now, all eyes were upon him. The first paw in met springy, faintly moist and cool earth. The fallen feathers had turned to mulch. It smelled like cinnamon, not overpoweringly so, just pleasantly so. He went in all the way. The last the Filioni saw on their perimeter screens, 20 of the hundred were its tails swishing back and forth. Then the tails were gone, and seventy screens showed them dim, strangely shadowed pathways between the giant conifers. Cat lad, can you draw any conclusions from those trails? 
The stalker padded forward. Paused. Yes, I, I can draw the conclusion they aren't trails. They go fairly straight for a while, then they come to dead ends at the bases of the trees. I, I'd say they were drag trails, if anything. What was dragged? Can you tell? No, not really, Homer. Whatever was dragged, it was thick and fairly smooth, but that's all I can tell. He prodded the drag tail with his secondary leg on the left side. In the pad of the paw were tactile sensors. The cat proceeded down the drag trail to the base of the great tree where the trail unaccountably ended. All around him were the great conifers, rose 600 feet into the warm, moist air. Sipper, in the ship, saw through the cat's eyes and pointed out things to his fellows. Some of the qualities of the pseudosuga taxifolia, but definitely a conifer. Notice the bark on that one, typically eucalyptus regnans, yet notice the soft red spores covering the bark. I've never encountered that particular sort of thing before. They seem to be melting down the trees. In fact, he was about to say the trees were all covered with red spores when the red spores attacked the cat. They flowed down the trees, covering the lower bark, each one the size of the cat's head, and when they touched, they ran together like jelly. When the red from one tree reached the base of the trunk, it fused with the red jelly from the other trees. Lad, it's all right, kicker, I see them. The cat began to pad backwards, slowly, carefully. He could easily outrun the fusing crimson jelly. Crimson jelly. He moved back toward the verge of the clearing. Charred, empty of life, blasted by the Filioni hacker hack shafts, not even a stump of the great trees above ground. The great circles where the trees had stood now merely reflective surfaces set flush in the ground. Back backing out of life, backing into death. The cat paused. What had caused that thought? Cat, those spores, whatever they are, they're forming into a solid. Backing out of life, backing into death. My name is Bailey, and I'm in here, inside you. I was stolen from my body by a creature called the succubus. He, it, is some kind of puppeteer. Once somewhere, he, there, in the stars, recruiter from out a sort of the blood red spore thing foot, stood 15 feet high, Formless, shapeless, changing, malleable, coming for the cat. The stalker did not move. Within him, a battle raged. Cat lad, return, get back. Though the universe belonged to the Filioni, it was only at moments when the loss of a portion of the, that universe seemed imminent that they realized how important their tools of ownership had become. Bailey fought for control of the cat's mind. Since centuries of conditioning fought back. The spore thing reached the cat and dripped around them. The screens of the filioni went blood red, then went blank. The thing that had come from the trees oozed back into the forest shivered for a moment, then vanished, taking the cat with it. The cat focused an eye, then another. In sequence, he opened and focused each of his 30 eyes. The place where he lay came into full luster. He was underground. The shapeless walls of the place dripped with sap in several colors of viscous fluid. The fluid dripped down over bark that seemed to have formed as stalactites, the grain running long and glistening till it tapered into needle tips. 
The surface on which the cat lay was plain wood, the grain exquisitely formed, running outward from a coral-colored path in concentric circles of hues that went from coral to dark teak at the outer perimeter. The spores had fissioned, were heaped in an alcove. Tunnels ran off in all directions, huge tunnels, 20 feet across. The mesh cap was gone. The cat got to its feet. Bailey was there, inside, fully awake, conversing with the cat. Am I cut off from the filioni? Yes, I'm afraid you are. Under the trees. That's right. What is that spore thing? I know, but I'm not sure you'd understand. I'm a stalker. I've spent my life analyzing alien life forms and alien ecology. I'll understand. They're mobile symbiotes conjoined with the bark of these trees. Singly, they resemble most closely an, an, a mnemonic anaerobic bacteria. Susceptible to dichotomization, they're anacusic, antibiotic, amnestic, and feed almost exclusively on encyclotomiosis. Hookworms? Big hookworms. Very big hookworms. The drag trails? That's what they drag. But none of that makes any sense. It's impossible. So is reincarnation against amongst the Yurbans, but it occurs. I don't understand. I told you you wouldn't. How do you know all this? You wouldn't understand. I'll take your word for it. Thank you. There's more about the spores and the trees, by the way. Perhaps the most important part, which is fused, they become a quasi-sentient gestalt. They can communicate, borrowing power from the tree hosts. That's even more implausible. Don't argue with me, argue with the creator. First cause, have it your way. What are you doing in my head? Trying very hard to get out. And how would you do that? Follow up your mission so the Filioni would demand the succubus replace me. I gather you're pretty important to them. Rather chicken shit, aren't they? I don't recognize the term. I'll put it in a sense form. Oh, you mean... Yeah, chicken shit. Well, that's the way it's always been between the Filioni and the Stalkers. You like it that way? I like my fish. The Filioni like to play God, don't they? Changing the world and that world to suit themselves. Reminds me of a couple of other guys. Lords of Propriety, they were called. And the Succubus. Do you ever stop to think about how many individuals and races like to play God? Right now, I'd like to get out of here. <laughs> Easy enough. How? Make friends with the Zekme. Uh, the trees or the spores? Both. One name for the symbiotic relationship? They live in harmony. Except for the hookworms. No society is perfect. Rule 19. The cat sat back on his haunches and talked to himself. Make friends with them, you say. Seems like a good idea, doesn't it? How would you suggest I do that? Offer to perform a service for them, something they can't do for themselves. Such as? 
how about you'll get rid of the filioni for then? Right now, that's the thing most depressing them. Get rid of the filioni. Yes. I'm harboring a lunatic in my head. Well, if you're going to quit before you start, precisely how, uh, do you have a name? I told you, Bailey. Oh, yes, sorry. Well, Bailey, precisely how do I rid this planet of a star-spanning vessel weighing somewhere just over 13,000 tons, not to mention a full complement of officers and ecologists who have been in the overlord position with my race for more centuries than I can name? I'm conditioned to respect them. You sure don't sound as if you respect them. The cat paused. This was true. He felt quite different. He disliked the Filioni intensely. Hated them, in fact. As his kind had hated them for more centuries than he could name. That is peculiar. Do you have an explanation for it? Well, said Bailey humbly, there is my presence. It may well have broken through all of your hereditary conditioning. You wear smugness very badly. Sorry. The cat continued to think on the possibilities. I, I wouldn't take too much longer if I were you, Bailey urged him. Then reconsidering, he added, as a matter of fact, I am you. You're trying to tell me something. I'm trying to tell you that the Gestalt Spore grabbed you to get a line on what was happening with the invaders, but you've been sitting here for some time amusing to yourself, which being instantaneously communicative throughout the many parts of the whole is a concept they can't grasp, and so it's getting ready to digest you. The stalker blinked his 30 eyes very rapidly. The spore thing? Uh-huh. Uh, all the spores eat are the hookworms, the bark starting to look at you with considerable interest. What do I, what do I talk to? Quick. Uh, you've decided you don't respect the Filioni so much, huh? I thought you said I should hurry. Just curious. Who do I talk to? The floor. So the stalker cat talked to the floor and they struck a bargain. Rather a lopsided bargain, true, but a bargain nonetheless. Seven. The hookworms, the hookworm was coming through the tunnel much more rapidly than the cat would have expected. It seemed to be sliding, but even as he watched, it bunched inchworm-like and propelled itself forward following the movement with another slide. The wood tunnel walls oozed with a noxious smelling moisture as the worm passed. It was moving itself on a slime track of its own secretions. It was eight feet across, segmented, a filthy gray in color, and what passed for a face was merely a slash mouth, dripping yellowish mucus, several hundred cilia-like feelers surrounding the slit, and four glaze-covered protuberances in an uneven row above the slit, perhaps serving in some inadequate way as eyes. Like a strange... Hansel dropping breadcrumbs to mark a trail, the spore things clinging to the cat's back began to ooze off. First one, then another. The cat backed down the tunnel. The hookworm came on. It dropped its fleshy, penis-like head and snuffled at the spore lying in its path. Then the cilia feelers attached themselves to the spore thing and was slipped easily into the slash mouth. There was a disgusting wet sound and the hookworm moved forward again. The same procedure was repeated at the next spore and the next and the next. The hookworm followed the stalker through the tunnel. 
some miles away, the Filioni stared into their screens as a strange procession of red spores formed in the shape of a long, thick, hawser-like chain er emerged from the forest and began to encircle the ship. That is a long sentence. Some miles away, the Filioni stared into their screens as a strange procession of red spores formed in the shape of a long, thick, hawser-like chain emerged from the forest and began to encircle the ship. Repulsor? Kicker asked. Not yet. They haven't made a hostile move, the Homer said. The cat could have won them somehow. This may be a welcoming ceremony. Let's wait and see. The ship was completely circled at a distance of 50 feet from the vessel. The Philly and I waited, having faith in their cat lad. And far underground, the stalker cat led the hookworm a twisting chase through tunnel after tunnel. Some of the tunnels were formed only moments before the cat and his pursuer entered them. The tunnels always sloped gently upward. The cat, dropping his spore riders as he went, led the enormous slug thing by a narrow margin, but enough to keep him coming. Then, in a final tunnel, the cat leaped to a plain outcropping overhead. Then to a tiny hole in the tunnel ceiling, and then out of sight. The Filioni shouted with delight as the stalker cat emerged from a hole in the blasted earth just beyond the circle of red spores, linked and waiting. You see? Good cat! Driver yelled to his fellows. But the cat made no move toward the ship. He's waiting for the welcoming ceremony to end, the Homer said with assurance. Then, on their screens, they saw first one red spore, then another vanished, as though sucked down to the ground from below. They vanished in sequence, and the Filioni followed their disappearance around the screens, watching them go in a 90-degree arc, then 180 degree of half-circle, then 250 degrees, and the ground began to tremble. And before the hookworm could suck his dinner down through a full 360 degrees of the circle, the ground gave way beneath the 13,000 tons of Filoni starship, and the vessel thundered through down into special tunnels dug straight down, plunged down with the plates of the ship separating and cracking open plunged down with the hookworm that would soon discover sweeter morsels than even red spore things. The Filioni tried to save themselves. There was very little they could do. Driver cursed the cat and made a final contact with the succubus. It was an automatic hookup, much easier to throw it in than to fire the ship for takeoff particularly a quarter of a mile underground. The hookworm broke through the ship. The Sekme waited. When the hookworm had gorged itself, they would move in and slay the creature. Then they would feast. But Bailey would not be around to see that great meal. For only moments after the Filoni ship plunged, crashing out of sight, he felt a ghastly wrenching at his soul self and the stalker cat was left empty once more, thereby proving in lopsided bargains no one is the winner but the house. And the soul of William Bailey went streaking out away from Belial toward the unknown. Deep in wooden tunnels, things began to feed. Nineteen eighty six. This I don't know, actually the short story could have been written before, but this compilation is from nineteen eighty six. Eight.
The darkness was the deepest blue. He could see nothing, not even himself. He could not tell what the body into which he had been cast did or had or resembled or did not do or not have or not resemble. He reached out onto the blue darkness. He touched nothing. But then perhaps he had not reached out. He had felt himself extend something into the blueness, but how far or in what direction, or if it had been an appendage, he did not know. He tried to touch himself and did not know where to touch. He reached for his face where a Bailey face would have been. He touched nothing. He tried to touch his chest. He met resistance and then penetrated something soft. He could not distinguish if he had pushed through fur or skin or hide or jelly or moisture or fabric or metal or vegetable matter or foam or some heavy gas. He had no feeling in either his hand or his chest, but there was something there. He tried to move and move but he did not know if it was rolling or hopping or walking or sliding or flying or propelling or being propelled. But he moved and he reached down with the thing he had used to touch himself and felt nothing below him. He did not have legs. He did not have arms. Blue, it was so blue. He moved as far as he could move in one direction and when there was nothing to stop him. He could have moved in that direction forever. He met no resistance. So he moved in another direction, opposite as far as he could tell. And as far as he could go, but there was no boundary. He went up and went down and went around in circles. There was nothing, endless nothing. Yet, he knew he was in somewhere. He was not in the emptiness of space. He was in an enclosed place. But what dimensions the place had, he could not tell. And what he was, he could not tell. It made him upset. He had not been upset in the body of Pink, nor in the body of Stalker Cat, but this life he now owned made him nervous. What? Why should that be? Something was coming for him. He knew that much. He was here, and something else was out there coming toward him. my goodness with all these new people thank you for the like thank you for the subscribe thank you for the troll blocking much appreciated he was here and he was something and something else was out there coming towards him he knew fear blue fear, deep, unseeing blue fear. It was coming fast. It would be here sooner, if slow, then later, but it was coming. He could feel, sense, intuit it coming for him. He wanted to change, 
to become something else, to become this, or to become this, or to become this, or to become this. But to become something else, something that could withstand what was coming for him, he didn't know what that could be. All he knew was that he needed equipment. He ran through his Bailey thoughts, his Bailey mind, to sort out what he might need. What he needed might be fangs, poisonous breath, eyes, horns, malleability, webbed feet, armored hide, talons, camouflage, wings, carapaces, muscles, vocal cords, scales, self-regeneration, stingers, wheels, multiple brains. What he already had? Nothing. It was coming closer. But was it getting farther away? And by getting farther away, becoming more of a threat to him? If he went toward it, would he be safer? If only he could know what it looks like, or where he was, or what was required of him. Orient, damn it, orient yourself, Bailey. He was deep in blueness, extended, fetal, waiting, shapeless. Shape. Could that be it? Something blue flickered in the blueness. It was coming end for end, flickering and sparking and growing larger, swimming toward him in the blueness. It sent tremors through him. Fear gripped him as it had never gripped him before. The blue shape coming toward him was the most fearful thing he could remember. And he remembered the night he had found Moravia with another man. They were standing, having sex in a closet at a party. Her dress was bunched up around her waist. He had her up on tiptoes. She was crying with deep pleasure, eyes closed. He remembered the day at the end of the war when a laser had sliced off the top of the head of the man on his left in the warm metal trench, the sight of things still pulsing in the jasmine jelly. He remembered the moment he had come to the final knowledge of his hopeless future, the moment he had decided to go to the center to find death. The thing changed shape and sent out scintillant waves of blueness and fear. He writhed away from them, but they swept over him, and he turned over and over trying to escape. The thing of blue came near, growing larger in his sight. Sight? Writhing? Fear? And the assault had failed, and now it would bowl through. He felt an urge to leap high. He felt himself do it, and suddenly his sight went up, and his propulsive equipment went lower, and he was longer, taller, larger. He fled, down through the blueness, with the coruscating blue devil following. It elongated itself and shot past him on one side, boiled on ahead until it was a mere pinpoint of incandescence on some heightless, dimensionless horizon. And then it came back toward him, thinning itself and stretching itself till it was opaque, till the blueness of where they were shone through it darkly, like effulgent isinglass in blue hyperplane. He trembled in fear and went minute. He bawled and shrank and contracted and drew himself to a finite point. And the whirling danger went hurtling through him and beyond and was lost back the way they had come. 
Inside the body he now owned, Bailey felt something wrenching and tearing. Fibers pulled loose from the moorings, and he was certain his mind was giving way. He had memories of sense deprivation chambers and what had happened to men who had been left in them too long. This was the same. No shake, no size, no idea or way of gaining an idea of what he was or where he was, or the touch, smell, sound, sight of anything as an anchor to his sanity. Yet, he was surviving. The dark blue devil kept arranging new assaults. And he had no doubt he would be back in seconds. Seconds? And he kept doing the correct thing to escape those assaults. But he had the feeling, feeling? That at some point, the instinctive reactions of this new body would be insufficient. And he would have to bring this new role, his essential bailiness, his human mind, his thoughts, the cunning he had begun to understand was so much a part of his way. And why had he not understood the cunningness when he had been Bailey all those years of his hopeless life? The effulgence began again somewhere off to his side and high above him, coming on rapidly. Bailey, something unknown, prepared as best he could. Marvelous, Anik, how, how did you manage to revitalize it? Oh, I'm sure you did, but how did you manage? Please, five? You really do want to win, don't you? <laughs> I know you don't look on this as a game, nor should I. And that's simply because you were born Althus. Well, when it meant something significant, yes. But time goes fluster. You? My dear good Anik. How could you say that? 10,000 tenels isn't too long. Not for a herder. Are you pleading for surcease, my friend? Do you submit? Why? Because your champion is a false soul in its body? Truly, Anik, you must think me a cully or a fool. Die, then go to reserve frames. I can't conserve myself now. Let me worry about the extent of my overextensions. You'll worry about that till the moment I destroy you. It was intended that we fight if you want out, I say go. Your substitute champion has no chance. I swear it, Anik. You, you, you. You may be sure. I paid dearly to do so, my dear Yaquil. The succubus, Yaquil. It cost me five ten ills of life. Chide me all you wish. Unlike you, I, I do not look on. But you do, you have always thought of it as game. Well, you were born herder. There was a time when it, and, and we remain. You cannot fluster me with platitudes. I, I can say it because we have waged this combat too long, but for an Althus it is. Call it an end, Yaquil. Do it now. Submission is no part of it. I merely say stop quickly. No, because the tenos pass and the heat goes and we die. Yes, die. And I've used more frames than I can afford. Better now than too late you overextend yourself, sir. Impudence. Impertinence. How you ever became a combatant? You leave me no alternative. Frames be damned, we fight. And concede a defeat I need not have conceded. Fight on. I offered you an opportunity. The time for talk is done.
The blue devil swept down on him, crackling with energy. He felt the incredible million sting points of pain and a sapping of strength. Then a... For it had. Now Bailey knew what he was and what he had to do. He lay still, swimming in the never-ending, forever blueness. He was soft and he was solitary. The blue devil swarmed and came on for the last time. And when it was all around him, Bailey let it drink him. He let its deep blueness and its fear and its sparkling effulgence sweep over him, consume him. The blue devil gorged itself, grew larger, fuller, more incapable of movement, unable to free itself. Bailey stuffed it with his amoebic body. He split and formed yet another, and the blue devil extended itself and began feeding on his second self. The radiating, sparking waves of fear and blueness were thicker now, coming more slowly. Binary fission again. Now there were four. The blue devil fed, consumed, filled its chambers and its source buds. Again, fission. And now there were eight. And the blue devil began to lose color. Bailey did not divide again. He knew what he had to do. Neither he nor the blue devil could win this combat. Both must die. The feeding went on and on. And finally the blue devil had drained itself with fullness. Made itself immobile. Died. And he died. And there was emptiness in the blueness once more. The frames, the tunnels, the fullness of combat were ended. And in the last fleeting instance of sentience, Bailey imagined he heard scented wails of hopelessness from the two duel masters somewhere out there. He gloated. Now they knew what it was to be a William Bailey, to be hopeless and alone and afraid. He gloated for an instant, then was whirled out and away. Nine. This time, his repose lasted only a short time. It was rush season for the succubus. Bailey went out to fill the husk of a master slave master whose pens were filled with females of the 83 races that peopled the snow drift cluster asteroids. Bailey succeeded in convincing the slave master that male chauvinism was detestable. And the females were bound into a secret organization that returned to their various rock worlds, overthrew all the male governments and declared themselves the independent feminist concourse. He was pulled back and sent out to inhabit the radio wave body of a needler creature used by the Kirk to turn suns nova and thereby provide them with power sources. Bailey gained possession of the needler 
and imploded the Kirk home son. He was pulled back and sent out to inhabit the shell of a 10,000 year old terrapin whose retention of random construction information made it invaluable as the overseer of a planetary reorganization project sponsored by a pale gray race without a name that altered solar systems just beyond the finger fringe deep out. Bailey, <laughs> let the turtle feed incorrect data to the world swingers, hauling the planets into their orbits, and the entire configuration collided in the orbit of the system's largest heavy mass world. The resultant uprising caused the total eradication of the pale gray race. He was pulled back. Finally, even a creature as vast and involved as the succubus, a creature plagued by a million problems and matters for attention, in effect, a god of sort, was forced to take notice. There was a soul in his file that was causing a fullness leak. There was a soul that was anathema to what the succubus had built his reputation on. There was a soul that seemed to be unthinkable as it was out to get him. There was a soul that was ruining things. There was a soul that was inept. There was a soul that was, again, unthinkably, consciously trying to ruin the work of the succubus that he had spent his whole life setting in motion. There was a soul named Bailey And the succubus consigned him to soul limbo till he could clear away present obligations and draw him under the lens for scrutiny. So Bailey was sent to limbo. 10. This is what it is like in soul limbo. Soft, pasty, maggoty white, roiling filled with sounds of things desperately trying to see. Slippery underfoot, without feet, breathless and struggling for breath, enclosed, tight, with a great weight pressing down till pressure was asphyxiating, but without the ability to breathe. Pressed brown, cork, porous and feeling imminent crumbling, then boiling liquid poured through. Pain in every filament and glass fiber. A wet thing settling into bones, turning them to ash and paste. Sickly sweetness, thick and rancid, tongued and swallowed and bloating bloating till bursting, a charnel scent, rising smoke burning and burning the sensitive tissues. Love lost forever. The pain of knowing nothing could ever matter again. Melancholia so possessive it wrenched deep inside and twisted organs that never had a chance to function. Cold tile. Black crepe paper. Fingernails scraping slate. Button panes. Tiny cuts at sensitive places. 
weakness. Hammering steadily pain. That was what it was like in the succubus soul limbo. It was not punishment. It was merely the dead end. It was the place where the continuum had not been completed. It was not hell for hell had form and substance and purpose. This was a crater, a void, a storeroom packed with uselessness. It was the place to be sent when past, present, future were one and indeterminate. It was altogether ghastly. Had Bailey gone mad, this would have been the place for it to happen. But he did not. There was a reason. Hi, welcome. Eleven. One hundred thousand eternities later. The succubus cleared his desk, his desk of present work, filled all orders, and answered all current correspondence, banished inventory, and took a long-needed vacation. When he returned, before turning his attention to new business, he brought the soul of William Bailey out of limbo and ushered it under the lens and found it somehow different. Quite unlike the millions and millions of other souls he had stolen. He could not put a name to the difference. It was not a force, not a vapor, not a quality, not a potentiality, not a look, not a sense, not a capacity. Not anything he could pinpoint. And of course, such a difference might be invaluable. So the succubus drew a husk from the spare parts and rolling stock bank and put Bailey's soul into it. And it must be understood that this was a consummately empty husk. Nothing lived there. It had been scoured clean. It was not like the many bodies into which Bailey had been inserted. Those had had their souls stolen. This was, uh, there was restraining potential in all of them. Uh, memories of persona. Fetters. Invisible, but present not, nonetheless. This husk was now Bailey. Bailey only, Bailey free, and Bailey whole. And the succubus summoned Bailey before him. Bailey might have been able to describe the succubus, but he has no such desire. The examination began. The succubus used light and darkness, lines and spheres, soft and hard, seasons of change, waters of Nepenthe, a handout, the whisper of a memory, car thing, enumeration, suspension, incursion, requital, and 13 others. It is quite the examination there. He worked over and what through the, and inside the soul he did not of Bailey. Oh gosh, this, okay, I gotta show you this because, because this, how it's written. What he did not know was that while he was examining Bailey, Bailey 
was examining him. He worked over and through and inside the soul of Bailey in an attempt to know and isolate the wild and dangerous difference that made this soul unlike all others he had ever stolen for his tables of fulfillment. For many races that were called upon him, but then when he had all the knowledge he needed, all the secret places, all the unspoken promises, all the wished and fleshed depressions, the power that lurked in Bailey, that had always lurked in Bailey, before either of them could try or hope to contain it, surged free. It had been there all along. Since the dawn of time, it had been there. It had always existed. The universe moves toward Godhood. It started there and wishes to return there. It is driven around in the greatest circle toward there. Godness lies dormant, yet remembered in everything, every smallest thing, in every puniest creature. <clears throat> I need my real glasses for this. This is tiny. Every living thing must, of needs, play at goodness. It is built in, in the basic fiber, in the racial memory, in the pulse of blood or thought. They remember all the way back to when there was nothing, yet none of them are God. Thus, it becomes a universe of things struggling ineptly toward a destiny they cannot even fathom, struggling impossibly to be God. A universe of manipulators, of users, of petty handlers who push and shove less ex, less God-driven races around in alien patterns, forcing them to dance to tunes they never knew, can barely comprehend in pain and hopelessness. Deprived of light or joy from the sleaziest legislators of ethic and fashion and morality to the greatest pawn movers of entire cosmic races. Everything, everyone scrabbles blindly toward the memory of when it was once God-blooded. All things try to govern the lives of all other things, and in turn those gods are used by other gods, and those gods are manipulated by greater gods, and on and on 
Domino Tanks of Puppet Masters to infinity and beyond. It is a universe of mad deities, one more selfish and corrupt than the next. For none of them are God. They are merely circular pieces of the all memory of what was goodness at the beginning. Latent in the word soul of what had been Bailey was the force that had first created everything. It had always been there, waiting its time, waiting to emerge and finish what it had started, buried, sleeping, handed down through the unimaginable eons in plant, stone, fish, cloud, vehicle. Bailey, first cause, perhaps God? Perhaps, any name will suffice. For if that force be God, then the bitter cynicism of the atheist is valid. For the God that was Bailey was insane, completely and eternally deranged. Who but a madman would create all of everything then bury itself dormant and slumbering, a madman buried in an eternal soul, passed down through the decaying time, buried here and there and everywhere, yet struggling to be reborn by a pressure of equalization, a necessity for balance in something even as lunatic as the mad world created by a mad god, but now freed like an evil genie from a bottle, the force that was god awoke, blossomed to fullness, rejuvenated by its slumber, stronger than it had been when it first created the universe and freed it set about finishing what it had begun millennia before bailey remembered the euthanasia center where it had begun for him, remembered dying, remembered being reborn, remembered the life of inadequacy, impotency, hopelessness he had led before he'd given himself up to the suicide center, remembered living as a one-eyed bear creature in a war that would never end, remembered being a stalker cat and the death of the ghastliness it could not be spoken of remembered blueness, remembered all the other lies, and remembered all the gods that had been gods himself, Bailey, the lords of propriety, the Filioni, the Montagasques, the Worms, the Slave Master, the Kirk, the pale gray race without a name, and most of all, He remembered the succubus. Who thought he was God? Even as the thieves thought they were gods, but none of them possessed more than the faintest scintilla of the all memory of godness. And Bailey had become the final repository for the force that was God. And now, freed, unleashed, unlocked, swirled, down all through of time to this judgment day, Bailey flexed his godness and finished what he had begun at the beginning. There's only one end to creation. What is created is destroyed. And then a full circle is achieved. Bailey, God, set about killing the sandcastle he had built. 
the destruction of the universes he had created. Never before, songs unsung, washed but never purified, dreams spent and visits to come, up and out of slime, drifted down on cool, trusting wind, heat, free, all created, all equal, all wondering, all vastness, gone tonight. The power that was Bailey, that was God, began its efforts. The husk in which Bailey lived was drawn into the power, the succubus screaming for reprieve, screaming for reason, screaming for release or explanation was drawn into the power. The soul station drawn in, the home world drawn in, the solar system of the home world drawn in, the galaxy and all the galaxies and all the meta galaxies and the far island universes and the alter dimensions and the past back to the beginning and beyond it to the circular place where it became now and all the shadow places and all the thought recesses and then the very fabric and substance of eternity, all of it, everything drawn in. All of it contained within the power of Bailey, who is God. And then in one awesome exertion of will, God Bailey destroys it all, coming full circle, ending what it had been born to do. Gone. All that is left is Bailey, who is dead in the region between. So that's the end of that one. As the longest story in the book. And um, yeah. If you if you already knew Harlan Ellison, you, you probably were not too surprised by the weirdness. If the weirdness was too much for you, go find some other channel. <laughs> that was the first thing I'd ever read by Harlan Ellison. And I was like 15. <laughs> so if you all want to know what's wrong with my brain, it's, um, it's fiction based. <laughs> what do you think of that one? I love that one. It's probably the hardest one to, um, follow. I had to put on my real glasses for that. Yeah. I can't believe how much more of that story I understand than the first time I read it. Or, I mean, I've read it multiple times since then, but my knowledge of what he may or may not be referring to is so much better. Oh, no, battery died. The succubus, well, the succubus, um, the succubus takes him out of um, limbo. And then when he goes to look at him, he puts him in an empty vessel to look at him. But in doing so, releases the Bailey, Bailey's inner God power, the seed of, uh, of God that spiral thing is really hard to read, but that's got to be the most profound part of the whole dang thing. The whole spiral.
the American Book of the Dead is a really good one too. That's another story I've had in my in my head. How's my battery doing? I'm what? Oh my gosh, it's only halfway. We've been on here for three hours. That's crazy to me. Welcome. Hi. Thanks for sticking through that. That that is a long one. That is a long one. Wood is another one that sticks in my head like frequently. What are we chatting about? We are chatting about um, science fiction short stories. I just finished reading the second one. And I think I'm going to read at least one more. There we go. I could read the introduction. J.G. Ballard, too. Again, like, I did not know any of these authors. Like, now I'm like, oh my gosh. Short stories are a really good way to, like, get introduced, though, because then you know, like, what their story is going to be. I don't know that I've really read much by Jody Scott. This first story, The American Book of the Dead, is by Jody Scott. And it's almost like, um... It's a, it's, it's a cautionary tale of sorts. I'm going to get some more water and let's read that one. I did not read the book of Eli. Thank you, soul. Now I have um, not had a lot of time to read. Um, in, basically since becoming a, a parent, like basically lost all of my reading time to reading like children's stories but it's all good <sighs> let's see where do I want to sit here And the music is at the beginning. Oh, 11-11. Nice. 8-11 here. Um, what was I saying? I have no idea. <laughs> I should, uh, I should take a smoke break, but maybe after this one. Thank you, David. The American Book of the Dead by Jody Scott. Even while she was still alive, Coriolanus hated to be pawed by strangers. Being smashingly beautiful seemed to put you in a whole separate category. A lot of people thought it was perfectly okay to leer or make remarks or grab you. Why was that? She wondered. Maybe they thought you were being elitist or something by virtue of you having been born gorgeous. But all that was over. She didn't care to dwell on the past. 
It would be morbid. An innocently healthy person, Corey had always felt that it was better to look ahead, although she could never forget how in life strangers had constantly tried to cop a feel, maybe back her into a corner and coax her into giving them their favorite kind of pain, or rip at her nicks while grinning hungrily into their eyes. And what eyes she had, or rather she had had, in the recent past when she was alive. What a silly way of putting it, as if she wasn't every bit as alive now. Her eyes had been so big and sparkling, such a luminous shade of lavender blue, and set far apart. But that was all over. To think she'd killed herself for a mere course. She'd wanted an A so badly, but now that seemed like a dumb, trivial reason. The course was The Craft of Dying, based on theories of Godel and Feinberg, with current anthropological assumptions regarding altered states of consciousness. It was a quirky title. But then Professor Eric Porlock, who gave the course, was a peculiar, peculiar man. He had been half killed on Ganymede in a kinky accident during the last war, and it was a bit strange. It was poor luck that had placed the notice in the flash that had brought the doomed class together. The ad said, join Deathology, research staff, earn credits, help others, and terminate your unbearable existence all at the same time. Oh yes, there's my neighbors being loud just in time. Ah yes. Uh, earn credits, help others, and terminate your unbearable existence all at the same time. That sounds like a great class. I would have probably, I might have taken that in high school, maybe not in college. The ad brought a chuckle, and the idea of death research was thrilling. It had been a big fad in the late 1990s, but then S&M became so pervasive and so popular that it was almost totally eclipsed. Corey couldn't resist signing up, and at first everything seemed quite normal. Professor Porlock was a little weird, even by today's lax standards, but she didn't think much of it. At the first workshop, he told the class about the accident that had motivated him to get into death research. And it sounded perfectly logical to Coriolanus. This happened many years ago on Ganymede, the professor said. We were after the gold that drifts in chunks some bigger than your head, born along the discrete depths of the microscopic sea life of that watery moon of Jupiter. We hadn't yet learned it cost too much by far to get it out. At 600 feet into an icy primordial soup, a diver hallucinates. I was wearing the normal gear for that depth, cumbersome is no word for it. A pressure suit, which has, has been, a pressure suit has never been designed that can match it. I saw a shark, a hallucination, of course, or was it? There's no life above the microorganism on Ganymede, or so we were told over and over. I fought the shark. It tore into me. The equipment was ruptured. At that pressure, I was all ready to flow out of the hole. Another few seconds and I would have been a strand of human spaghetti. The pain was unbearable. I blacked out. I kept wondering, am I going to die or am I already dead? Almost immediately, the submersible was able to grapple me into the main unit, but I knew I had really died. I was floating above my head, looking directly at my physical body. Now just an empty shell. I heard music, incredibly beautiful harmonies, the music of the spheres, and felt a deep serenity. There were lights, 
I spoke with a deceased brother. I came back to consciousness on a table. The resuscitators were humming. The faces of my teammates were peering down at me. I told them I had been dead and they didn't believe me. That experience changed me. I wanted to find out what had happened to me. I wanted to explore the shock syndrome or transcendental experience or whatever it was to a degree that some might call an obsession. The rest is history on file in the archives where anyone can get at it, all leading directly to this class, to this very day. Now, what you kill yourself for must be valid and important. Trivial reasons will not be accepted. He explained that it would be a simulation of near-death event and perfectly harmless, of course but as close to the real thing as they could achieve. Then he swore the class to secrecy. Nothing we discuss must go beyond this room, he said. One thing worried Coriolanus. How did Professor Porlock get a permit to have the ceiling cameras turned off? No ordinary citizen got that kind of permit. The professor must have a politician friend or some kind of pull that wouldn't quit. He had a deeply lined, thin face and was tall and gaunt and not at all trendy, wearing slightly passe chain mail with worn satin knickers, spats, sash, and black varnish topper. Plain enough garments. But he had a powerful gaze that verged on the hypnotic. He scared Coriolanus. She knew it was silly, but he did. Still, as the days flew by, Corey learned many things. The subject had been well documented by deathologists, doctors whose patients had presumably been dead for several minutes, but then recovered and were able to tell what they knew about the experience. She loved the two course books, the Tibetan Book of the Dead and the Egyptian Book of the Dead. They were ancient tomes full of quaint words that had been written many, many centuries ago. What a good idea to have a handbook for when you died. Otherwise, how would you know what to do at that critical moment when the energy field known as the vital X or the soul departed from your body? Americans had never had such a guidebook. They had no coaching at all. They were expected to dive blindly, just to go ahead and stumble into whatever was happening next. Coriolanus felt this was highly unfair. She loved to be the one to write a popular book for Americans on the subject. What to do when you die was a title she liked. Or to sell better, maybe it should be the power of death how you can use it to get everything you want. The course said, uh, the course notes said there was an American book of the dead written years ago, but it was basically an update of the Tibetan one. There were no truly upfront scientific modern American handbooks as far as uh, Corey could tell. Of course, she was just a beginner. She had a lot to learn. And at the moment, she was absolutely convinced that she had to kill herself. <sighs> had she really killed herself, or was it just another fantasy? Professor Porlock had said, during the moments of death, various misleading illusions occur. On the first day, it is all sweetness and light. The Muslim has a soothing vision of Muhammad and Allah taking his hands and leading him beside the still water. The American Indian sees the happy hunting ground spread out around him in full colorful detail. But after the first rosy glow, your own mental condition will begin to pull other images in upon you. Examples. On the 13th day, the disturbed Tibetan will see the red Pukase 
holding coils of intestines in the right hand and putting them into her mouth with the left. The Tibetan will also see the dark green gasmari holding a blood-filled skull, stirring it with a dorji, then drinking it with majestic relish. He will see the yellowish-white sandali wearing a head, a head off a corpse, the right hand holding a heart, the left putting the corpse into her mouth. The first day is all pastoral scenery, calm and serene, but what frightful visions are an untrained, upset American will see on the 13th day, we have no idea. This is precisely what we're here to find out. To repeat, on the first day, the Jew meets Abraham and Moses and perhaps Groucho and Mel Brooks as well, while the Catholic meets the Virgin and St. Peter. It depends entirely on one's training and expectations. For example, if I were to repeat over and over that upon dying you will be greeted by the horse-necked king and the red hoopoe headed desire goddess and the wrathful goddess rich in space, as the Tibetans did, that is precisely what would occur. The universal fact seems to be that all of us enter a pretty landscape see various lights, and greet our departed friends. This is why the death phenomena must be studied long before death takes place, while the subject is in an excellent physical condition, and readouts show you all are. The class grinned at each other. Porlock continued. When the untrained vital X gets out of the body, the first thing it does is have a look around and say, am I dead or alive? And it doesn't know which. The dead can see and hear everything that goes on. They see their friends crying, their body being wheeled away. They see the mortician who embalms them. They also see lights, rays, and other things, and hear sound. This can be upsetting, grotesque, even terrifying. It can also be fatiguing. But you must accustom yourself to this state just as a newborn must accustom itself to our world. It takes three or four days to realize that yes, you really are dead. At first there's a wonderful liberating feeling of sheer bliss we've all heard about. Now the purpose of this course is to enable you to hold on to that desirable state. Our goal is to be calm and timeless, rather than oppressed and exhausted. It's purely a matter of practice. As in learning any skill, we must drill, drill, and drill some more. Porlock smiled and continued. Trained in self-discipline, you can do it. Just remember to stay calm, don't panic, and whatever you do, don't get caught in the motivational traps of jealousy, revenge, or greed. If you do, you'll only slip right back into the darkness of ego demands, a pit of nightmare we will, we may well call hell. My job is to help you avoid this sort of thing. Don't be attached to joys or sorrows, and at all costs, avoid jealous fury or extreme fear. They will set you back. You mean no more spook shows? Someone asked. Porlock frowned, opened the book, and read, If you are to be born on a higher plane, the vision of that plane will be dawning upon you. Whether you wish to retain that state of bliss is your decision. Well, that kind of advice was all very fine, but how was Coriolanus supposed to hold on to that state, or any state, when she was so damn mixed up? She tried to think clearly and remember exactly what happened. Let's see. She thought she had turned on the gas in the kitchen of the unit she shared with Ted, her CIAOU partner. Then she placed her head on the bottom shelf of the oven on a soft fluffy towel newly purchased from Fields, an apricot colored cannon bath towel with a beige border. The towel was there so she'd be comfortable while making the transition. The transition came sooner than expected. It often does. 
Like many suicides, Coriolanus had hoped up to the very last instant that Ted would smell the gas and come rushing in and say, Cory, please don't do it. I'll be the aggressor. I'll hurt you any way you like. I swear by the divine marquee. Getting down on his knees and crying, please, Cory, please. Or even, Cor, baby, don't leave me. I'll never massock with anyone else. I swear it. I'll just be, it'll just be you, me, and Chip. Chip, of course, was the computer chip everyone had implanted at birth in his or her brain for full mental health. It induced the CIAOU of every hidden secret sexual fantasy in the closed closed in around orgasming you. The intensely marvelous foreplay leading to frenzies of exquisite shudders like nothing else could do. CIAOU produced a come-together version of the fulfillment you most desired. It was used to offset boredom. Boredom could be a killer in today's world. Where people had been so bombarded with loud noises, crime, violence, other people's sex, and frenzied images of paranoia that they could no longer experience certain parts of life without boosters. That's why there were all these quirky courses and pain sessions, and why, up to the last minute, Corey had hoped that Ted would take her into his arms and rush her to the hospital where she'd be quickly revived, as she'd often been before. But, no such luck. Before she knew what had happened, the wrathful goddess rich in space was saying with a merry smile, Welcome and congratulations, Coriolanus. Here we are again, my dear, in prenatal existence. Now, just a darn minute. All this was happening too fast. She had to sort all this stuff out. Professor Porlock had talked so fast it was hard to take notes. In stirring tones, he had read from the Egyptian book, Your soul lives and your veins are firm. You breathe the air and emerge into the light of day like a god. And that class was recited by the priest of the mummy before burial. The book was written on a roll of papyrus. It was described going through, it described going through the portals of all, of the, <laughs> it described going through the portals of the other world. My point is, thousands of years ago, people already knew what we've only discovered about what happens at the moment of death. Now, we can define in an ordinary sequence D, N1, N2, N3, and so on. So, there's no general way of telling in a finite number of steps whether a given positive integer is or is not D. Should one then regard D as clearly defined? Question. Lowering her hand shyly, Coriolanus quavered, what does the D stand for? At the, at the moment we are attempting to define death, Porlock said gravely, statements can be formulated which can neither be proved nor disproved within the system. Not everything can be measured with a ruler. This is where Godel comes into the picture. To step outside the system we call death will be quite a trick, will it not? The most brilliant student in the class, whose name was Daniel Berg, asked, Is this the nature of an occult hype, Professor, or are we actually being asked to step outside the system? Porlock scowled. He sometimes ignored Berg's questions. Berg was flippant. The Professor disliked disrespect laughter, and interruptions. At times he even sank into gloom and wouldn't speak. He had a trick of inserting both hands into his sash, tipping his head back and gazing at the student with the most withering, scornful, devastating, but strangely compelling and provocative look Coriolanus had ever seen. Even Ted never looked that sinister when they were deep in their chips and exploring the most excruciating C-I-A-O-U a person could hope to orgasm wildly over. Porlock took his time about answering. His voice was loaded with impeccable scorn. Would you call a giant steel womb of unjammable channels a hype, Mr. Berg? Hardly, but I don't see. 
This is a difficult course. You can't just skate through it relying on what you seem to consider your elitist status. But you can't keep your nose in the air here, Mr. Berg. I never intended to. We have several million dollars worth of micro equipment in this lab, Porlock went on. Fifty years ago, you'd have been hooked up to an outlandish and cumbersome equipment. Blood monitoring devices, ultrasonic scanners, tubes going in and out, electroencephalographs, and all the rest of it. I'd be photographing your body aura by the old Curlian methods and measuring your brainwave signals in microvolts and on and on. Today, I'm doing all this without a touch, without an imposition. Is the mere lack of mass a reason to take what I'm saying lightly? Does the fact that we are at this moment measuring the colonic spasm caused by your unexpressed fear upset you unduly? Say, to the point where you'd be willing to drop this class? Berg hastily said, no, no, of course not. And Porlock went on reading from the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Maybe those old lamas really caught a glimpse of the fourth dimension and twisted the veil from the greatest of life's secrets. Both Young and the Druids taught us to learn to die is a science most profitable and passing all other sciences. We've been brought to a standstill by Freudianism and by our own backyard backward biological ideas. But now Western man must awaken from his long slumber of ignorance and confront the incredible mass of evidence which tells us that dying, we don't go out like so many candles, nor do we find ourselves in an old-fashioned heaven or hell. The living come from the dead as Socrates intuitively perceived as he was about to drink the hemlock and experience death. Tell me, how many of you would welcome such an opportunity? A few tentative hands went up. Porlock said, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Obviously, you understand the exploration of man's demise in a truly scientific manner. And is incomparably more important than the exploration of outer space. We know that you will experience a psychic thrill, a glimpse of pure truth, subtle, sparkling, bright, dazzling, glorious, and radiantly awesome. This is the radiance of your own nature. Understand that and all goes well. Otherwise, if you see something that upsets you, such as friends arguing over your belongings or your will, do not fly into a rage. You've been told this many times. Buddha said it. Jesus said it. Now hear it once again in equally poetic language. If you don't master your emotions, you will wander into the abodes of the divas and be drawn into the whirl of the six lokas. You will see the dull bluish yellow light from the human world. If you follow it, you will be born in the brute world again and will suffer birth, age, sickness, and death and be stuck in the quagmire of worldly existence. World round and round, you'll be made to taste the suffering thereof. But on that first day, does something strike you as funny, Mr. Berg? No, not at all, Berg grinned. Porlock went on. On that first day, the terrifying karmic illusions, which are your own thought forms, have not yet dawned, nor have the frightful apparitions or experiences caused by the lords of death. Again, the purpose of this course is to teach you how to confront these demons, knowing that they come from yourself, and go on to the pure paradise, paradise realms. None of this is to be taken literally, of course, but... I know of no other way to express the transcendental. Questions? There were no questions. I want you to face death heroically. Please get the word hero defined. It will be on the exam. Porlock was passing around a paper for everyone to sign. It was a hold harmless contract that said, whatever happened to you in this workshop was your own fault, and you could sue neither the professor 
nor the college for it. Well, that seemed fair enough. Coriolana signed it. But she wouldn't let anyone poke needles into her arm or play with her mind or her body either without express permission. All in all, Cory was enthralled. It could have been group trance, but she both loved and hated this professor at the same time. It was that she knew him from long ago. She yearned to ask questions, but didn't want to sound dumb in front of the class. So when the others had gone, she went up and told him how confused she was. If he insulted and belittled her when they were alone, as he sometimes did to Daniel Berg, it wouldn't matter. I'm a hopeless dope, she smiled, lowering her gaze, but I still don't know what you mean by D being a round trip in the Godel sense, or whatever you mean by all that stuff about visions and illusions. The eyes were suave and cool, maybe a bit sardonic. He uncoiled his long legs from the chair and wrote a reading list so that she could learn more about the tachyon and deteriorating sequences and so on. In particular, he said she should concentrate on these questions. Does the body lose a significant amount of mass when the vital X separates off? And if atoms and molecules are not involved, what exactly accounts for this weight loss? He spoke of experimentation in the scientific method, and varying one thing at a time. He looked straight into her eyes. The whites of his own eyes were discolored and bloodshot. He advised, when we know more of the dead, it will be time to pursue the living. Trying to remember what happened next, Corey got confused. All she could think of was her own funeral and friends who came up to Ted and asked, but why? Why did she do it, Ted? I just can't understand. She had everything to live for. Corey agreed wholeheartedly. She did have everything to live for, so how could she possibly have bumped herself off? Ted says it was because she was in love with a certain professor who spurned her. He showed a note that Corey had written this professor whose name was Eric Porlock. When I get my hands on Porlock, I'll knock his teeth out, Ted said. That was nice of Ted, but he was wrong. Corey didn't love Porlock, and the note was definitely forged. In fact, she was almost certain the idea of suicide was a mere fantasy. Something of the order of seeing Jesus waiting at the end of a long tunnel of light. Porlock said everyone's mind had been so filled with dramatized concepts of death and religious fables and the ideas of other people that these confusions occurred as a matter of course. One thing was for sure. When you made the transition, time became scrambled. She tried to figure out the correct sequence, which went something like this. Corey stayed unconscious right up to the morning of the funeral. A dreary and squalid little affair she was thankful to forget. Then, for about a week, all she did was hang around that small, unimpressive plastic tombstone, lost in a labyrinth of other little fake marble tombstones, and whimper inaudibly because she had not only lost a gorgeous body, but had gone neither to heaven nor to hell, nor out like a candle. She still existed. Imagine that. But she felt so stupid and wretched about the whole thing. She almost forgot her purpose in dying, which was to get an A in poor Luck's course. Or even, she hardly even let herself think about this part anymore, but it was to take detailed notes of everything that happened and write the American Book of the Dead so that, was it still possible? Millions of others wouldn't be as confused by this crazy business as she was. 
But then another problem came up. A rap group called Kryptonon, or Crips Anonymous, was being formed for the benefit of the newly deceased men and women so they could learn to cope during this difficult and sudden adjustment period. Corey thought of not joining. She needed to be alone and think things out, but the others talked her into it. You have so much to offer, they pointed out. She needed a little flattery after her recent uh, bereavement, so she agreed to join. At first, at the first session, she met some interesting people and was amazed to find out that a few of them had even been in Porlock's deathology class. Each member of Kryptonon got to tell his or her own special or particular loss, grief, joy, pain, or gain, and discuss those of the others. The consensus was that, yes, you certainly did see light, hear voices, and travel down a long, wide tunnel full of blazing light. And you did speak with old friends and meet fictional characters like Scrooge, Madame Bovary, and Charlie Brown. And that right in the start came a glorious sense of freedom and release as known as that first fine careless rapture. Unfortunately, this was only a transitional phase. It kicked into the deteriorating sequence D1, D2, D3, which turned out to be that old familiar sequence of denial, bargaining, grief, anger, propitiation, and so on, along with sheer frustration over the fact that no matter how hard you tried, you simply could not get rid of yourself permanently. And while they were discussing it, the group captain came in. His name was the Horse-Necked King. Many people, when they die, seem to fumble around blindly, grab the first available infant body, and get born in a hurry the horse-necked king told them. This group bypassed that syndrome for reason or reasons unknown. Either you lack an obsessive need to get back in the game or something else is going on. Any ideas? Everyone expressed confusion. Corey was in her glory taking all these terrific notes as fast as she could write. Death, the most simple, most natural phenomenon known to man. Why fear it? There is nothing to it. You hardly even know what's happening. And the horse-necked king was a genial host who kept them laughing. In terms of quantum mechanics, it's important to find God, but we're not ready for that. Is this a true or false question? Let's see a show of hands. And yet something strange was going on here. Corey wished she could figure out what it was. She noticed that at least four other people besides herself, including Daniel Berg, all of whom had been in Porluck's death class, were now here. What did that mean? What was going on? Something nagged her, something she'd forgotten. Was this a field trip or something? What was it? She almost had it, then it slithered away. The horse neck king said, don't let those Orientals get ahead of you. Show a little Yankee ingenuity. The Tibetans didn't have the last word. Let's get practical here. If someone tells you revenge is to be avoided, maybe he's got a reason. Maybe he or she wants to escape your revenge. Ever think about that? Maybe that person was trying to elude a just and rightful punishment. He spoke of the stress of impinging on the 3DU, making your thoughts visible to the living and sending out the transfilaments that get imprinted on the 3DU, which are the source of all matter and which come before a maneuver called making the jump out of the dream world into the womb of flesh and blood. What did that mean? Selling yourself on the idea of getting back into the rough and tumble game is how the horse-necked king put it. All this crazy stuff triggered something in Coriolanus and reminded her of something. She couldn't think what, but she was sure it had something to do with Professor Eric Porlock. The red hoopoe-headed desire goddess spoke next. She explained that time happens all at once. 
now is only a viewing slot. She asked for testimonials and up jumped Brad, a former lead singer for the New York Hong Band. Brad said that he had gone to the veterinarians in a dog suit and asked to be put to sleep. He was motivated by boredom, due to which a blow on the head, which happened at a concert and de which destroyed his chip. After an exchange of credits, the vet obliged and here Brad was. Congratulations and welcome, smiled the red hoopoe headed desire goddess. Everyone applauded and she again called on the horse necked king to give an inspirational talk. The horse necked king advised them to get a mind scissor on their former enemies. Always play over your head. Do things nobody else dares to do and don't ever be intimidated. Play from a position of power. There are over 10 billion of us dead people and only 4 billion of those others, so don't let them push you around. We outnumber them nearly 3 to 1. While Coriolanus was taking notes and getting more and more excited, it suddenly hit her. She never put her head in any oven. And she never wrote any notes to Porlock. What really happened was she had been murdered by Porlock and then forgot, having been in the state of amnesia and shock with which death produces. Leaping up, she cried out, that man killed me. He wasn't doing it for research at all. He was just a sadistic creep. He said he was inducing a harmless trance and I should take notes. Then he murdered me and made it look like suicide. There was a pandemonium. The deathology class was going through paroxysms of stupef stupefaction, amazement and fury. Daniel Berg convulsed with rage, stamped and shouted over and over, that pervert killed me. He gave me an after dinner mint and started reading the death services and that's the last I knew. My parents think I committed suicide. I can't stand it. By now the whole class was there. Angry words flew. Porlock must think he can do whatever he likes with a human life. Not Porlock, the government. He's just a tool. What was it, a blood sport? Is he insane? They compared notes. Each had been given an after-dinner mint. It happened at the last lab session of the course. Corey ate her mint, thinking it was only a friendly gesture because this was the final night. They were all sitting around laughing and joking. Then they lay on their slabs. No, not slabs, scales. Porlock said, remember, you must be scientist enough to take your own mental pulse through each step of the mock biological death which the mints you have eaten will produce. Please relax completely. Take a deep breath. Now another and another. A crackle of impending excitement hung in the air. The class lay back calmly, naked and smiling and thrilled with anticipation. Soon, Corey's body was glistening with sweat. Porlock began reciting, O oh, nobly born students, that which is called death is coming to you now. Now thou art experiencing the radiance of the clear light of pure reality. Recognize it. Thine own intellect is now voidness, but not the voidness of nothingness, but the intellect itself, unobstructed, shining, thrilling, and blissful. The naked consciousness now enters the realm of the clear light. The man blinded by the darkness of ignorance, the fool caught in the meshes of his own actions, and the illiterate man, by listening to this great tantra, are released from the bonds of karma. Corey noted that she was paralyzed but had no pain. Porlock's voice droned on. As for the common worldly folk, what need is there to mention them? By fleeing through fear, terror, and awe, they fall over the precipices into the unhappy worlds and suffer. He had begun moving around, attaching cylinders to the probe body. Corey felt the touch of metal on her eyelids, underarms, scalp, belly, and genitals. 
she heard Porlock reciting, Do not be attracted towards the dull blue light of the brute world where stupidity predominates, and where you will again suffer the illimitable miseries of slavery and dumbness and stupidness, and it will be a very long time before you can get out. She tried to scream, but no sound came. There was a terrible pain in her throat, an agonized squeezing. She had become blind, then totally paralyzed. Then there was a blur of rushing sound followed by blackness. Next thing she knew, she was out of her body, hovering somewhere near the ceiling. Was it auto-suggestion or group trance, as Porlock had said? She noticed how dusty the light fixture was. She didn't want to look at what was going on below. Porlock doing unspeakable things while he recited, and now embark upon the perilous ocean and pray for the divine hand to guide you in the great march to the beyond. She went into a tunnel. The inside was so luminous it blinded her to look at it. She heard soothing music and saw people everywhere. Her grandparents were there. Her Aunt Ivy and Uncle Chester, who had died last year in a shuttle crash, came up to say hello. Then Natalie Wood took her both hands, smiled, and said welcome and congratulations. Truman Capote laughed and gave her a little hug. Bobby Kennedy gave her a big hug, and Philip K. Dick said he liked her style. Even John Wayne waved from across the tunnel, and she got a glimpse of the sainted Boy George, who died leading an uprising on Titan years before she was born. All this kind of attention was wonderful. Corey was in her glory meeting all these dead celebrities, and it helped her to fully understand deep down where it really counted that she too was dead and had been so ever since that incredible day in Professor Porlock's classroom. And it struck her with furious force how angry she was at Porlock. What a sadist that man in is. He's crazy, she cried out. The red hoopoe headed desire goddess rapped for silence, proclaiming, I want to thank all of you for sharing that with us, but would like to point out an important fact. The anger you are experiencing must be resolved, or else it will turn into or else it will turn inward and fester. And the only way you can resolve it is through revenge. She called on the horse-necked king, who said, we'll take a vote, but I can see some of you aren't too sure about this. Here's a point to consider. A revenge motive will give you an interesting project and take your mind off your self-created phantoms. Berg said he liked that idea. Corey said, but I feel guilty about wanting to harm Porlock. Oh, those are normal moral delinquencies. Don't worry about them. Uh, I've got to be able to live with myself. Can you do it knowing that Porlock remains unpunished? They took a vote. Everyone agreed that the evil professor should be destroyed, except Corey, who was still uncertain. The horse-necked king said, do you want to be responsible when he does the same thing to the next class? So she agreed. But how? To the dead? Do the dead have any power over the living? Murderers are tampering with forces they don't fully understand. Setting up a guilt trap is a simple matter. And Porlock is a psycho shrimp, someone said. Don't forget, from the legal point of view, we died of ill treatment, said Berg. In view of the facts, it is incumbent upon us to be the judge, jury, and executioner. The horseneck king said, what we do is we give him a vision. No, give him a supervision. Poison his life with an unknown horror, then ram it home. 
Hands waved. I got it. The best and surest way is to hang a dead rat around his neck, said Berg. Come again? The rhyme of the ancient mariner, said Berg. Excited, Coleridge wrote that poem to make the supernatural seem real, and it was. The mariner killed the pet albatross with his crossbow. The superstitious sailors hung the dead albatross around his neck. I think you've got it, cried the wrathful goddess, rich in space, elated. Back in the past, where I come from, if a farmer had an animal that killed chickens, what he'd do is he'd hang a dead chicken around that animal's neck for about a week. And that, after that, it would never kill another chicken. I vote we hang a dead Daniel Berg around this fiend's neck. How many of you like it? They all, except Berg, liked it a lot. Give him geological eyes, said the red hoopoe headed desire goddess. Give him images he can't refuse. Just you watch, you new people, as we smoke this killer out. There are many abuses to correct, agreed the horse-necked king, and it's too complicated to calculate, so watch how it works. Daniel Berg said, hold on, let's not use my body. It wouldn't be effective. I yield the honor to Corey here. We'll hit Porlock right between the eyes and use Corey's body. That's bound to upset him a lot more. They started slow. In Porlock's classroom, a door swung open silently. Behind it lurked Corey, her eyes wide and staring, and then the group immediately peppered him with scenes from his own past. The childhood home, yesterday's breakfast, kindergarten, the day he made full professor, an embarrassing moment or two. Porlock fled to his cabin in the forest preserve, where fireflies spelled out the word murderer. He shook his fist at them. You aren't real, he screamed. I'm on Ganymede in a damp, fetid ocean cave, and I'll be rescued any minute now. The horse-necked king said, it couldn't be better. He's being choked to death by his own guilt. If we handle this entire execution this well, Porlock will never be alive again in any sense of the word. For a dozen dreams, they had Professor climb a twisting path that wound up a long, bleak, windswept hill. They, he was bedeviled by dim voices. He couldn't make out what they said. Each time when he was just about to reach the summit, he would stumble on Corey's body hidden under a heap of leaves and wake up chewing his fingers in a cold sweat. He turned to his chip for comfort. Porlock's fantasy was a mild one. Nothing but a hollow-cheeked woman who wore boots and put clothespins on his nipples and penis, but while he was enjoying his C-I-A-O-U and getting a little bit of relief, they turned the hollow-cheeked woman into Corey's dead body. Next, Corey Alanis became, became an elusive shadow in the classroom. Weird music and vaporizing clouds were produced with pressure codes tied to the inertia of his own guilt. They made a new gravity envelope for his front head and played horror movies inside his brain. They installed a tiny corpse, Coriolanus, bumping at the inside of his chest. They analyzed his case in group discussion and came to some interesting conclusions. Like most mass murderers, Porlock had been on the verge of collapse for some time. Satisfied desire only brought on the feverish pursuit of new victims. A recent one was Corey, now propped in her unusual seat in the middle row in a moderate state of decay. She also visited him every night, but Porlock was a man of extraordinary toughness. With a clever mind and the courage of the demented. He woke up yelling, this is deceptive, a temporary malady only, and went on about his business. They used Porlock for target practice. Bang, you're a lost soul, pumping adrenaline through his bloodstream, but being careful not to grant him the easy escape of cardiac arrest. They sent brimstone whimpers and grinding noises that seemed to arise from inside his groin. Then they took a few days off. 
It works better if the criminal thinks he's been given a reprieve, said the red hoopoe headed desire goddess. Remember, it's not enough to kill his body. We've got to kill him. Vacation over. Porlock walked to his desk and picked up the day's mail. A miasma of dead fish, wet logs, and methane, rotten smells of tumish, fetid, organic, blood rooty Coriolanus melted and spread out, sending Porlock spinning. He was flung up with the force of a superheated energy bolt, then picked up just as carefully and set on his feet. Although the floor was moving, he ran outside to where a terrible sun climbed a terrible sky and shed its terrible rays on a terrible landscape. Small monsters rained down on the top of his air car. He yanked open the door, hoping to drive away to safety, but Corey's body lay sprawled in the back seat. Come play with me, Eric, dear, said her cold and bloodless lips. The only part still intact was her lovely flowing hair, which was as pretty as ever. She stretched out decaying arms to the professor who screamed and fled down the street street after street for hours like a crazy man then walked for several hours and finally calmed down there's a certain amount of satisfaction in doing it well remarked the wrathful goddess rich in space porlock turned toward home a pale mass detached itself from a snowy hedge and followed him it was Corey's body she touched his shoulder with a dead hand a chunk of tissue fell off he shrieked Another few minutes, and they'd have him. Porlock ran upstairs. There was Corey's body in the hallway. He ran and slammed the elevator door, and there was Corey's body in the elevator. She smiled at him with a badly decomposed face. He went berserk. A burst of laughter, laughter from behind a potted palm. Suffering from acute mental exhaustion, Porlock let himself into the apartment. With trembling hands and weak knees, he wiped his face, poured himself a shot of Io, and tossed it off. Then he sat down to write a note, but a fire broke out under the desk. With a howl, Porlock ran to the big porcelain antique stove that had cost him a small fortune, a luxurious cavern in which to terminate an unbearable existence, and turned on the gas. On the lower shelf, he placed a fluffy, soft, new apricot-colored towel that had a beige border. Then he drew up a chair, put his head on the towel, and began sobbing brokenly. The transition took only eight minutes, give or take a few milliseconds. The sobs gradually died away. Then Corey grew impatient and asked, Why isn't Professor Porlock here? Because this is an execution. You were on the jury that agreed no good end could be served by allowing this fiend to continue his miserable existence in any sense of the word. But I didn't mean permanently, she cried. Of course you did, the horse-necked king assured her. But that can't be, she argued. Remember the ordinary sequence D, N1, N2, N3, and so on? It proves death is a simple, natural phenomenon, and the professor will surely be joining us in a few minutes. See for yourself, the horse-necked king shrugged and pointed to the porcelain stove. Corey smelled gas and saw the apricot-colored towel, the head, then Porlock's ghastly expression. His eyes were wide open. They stared at her with a fixed, hideous glare. Don't be angry, Professor, she smiled. We only want to congratulate and welcome you. But the horse-necked king had been correct. Professor Eric Porlock was no longer alive in any sense of the word. There you go. That was The American Book of the Dead by Jody Scott. From the collection Afterlives, Stories About Life After Death. Fun fun times. Oh, 
I don't know if I'm going to be able to read any more tonight, but that was really fun. Wow. Four hours. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. Since, you know, a lot of silly people in this country think it's going to be the rapture tomorrow, I thought it was appropriate. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, I lost the music halfway through, too. I think that was only three hours of music I had lined up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it would be kind of nice. Like, the rapture would make it, like, nice and quiet. Like, nobody would be um, going after my books anymore, right? Like, we won't be burning books. I don't know. One can hope. We'll know. If it's just sensible, reasonable people left tomorrow, we'll know. You know, fortunately, my neighbors quieted down. Oh my goodness. Sunday fun day. Here we go. Yeah, I'm a mess. A mess, I tell you. Thank you for all the likes and subscribes always appreciated you're working on the new the next the next goal 6k i mean i could pick a bigger number you guys could surprise me also patreon doing good um let's see what do i got here got my soup Soup's on. I could eat soup. I could put on some music. I could uh, be silly. I don't know. I don't want to leave. It was so boring here by myself. <laughs> I wait all week just to have time to myself and then I want to spend it with other people. There's so many more of those, um, the sources, like, okay, when I first read that, I had not, I did not have a lot of in kind of philosophy or religious studies under my belt. And I just thought all that was like, oh my God, fiction writers are so amazing. Where do they think of this stuff? And of course, then to find out like, oh, the Tibetan book of the dead is real. The Egyptian book of the dead is real. <laughs> um, and then to look into that. So it's like, oh my goodness. It's just so interesting to me, like, I don't know, you can, you can enjoy it without knowing any of that stuff. And you can also enjoy it, even if you know, they like had their inspirations come from real places. I don't know, it almost made it more interesting to me. It's like breadcrumbs, right? And um, there was music too, like there was alt music that I would listen to and they would like refer to something like wow are you super creative no they're just like talking about occult stuff or religious stuff or philosophy that you haven't heard of yet okay that's the way it's gotta be I hope you have a good night thank you Thank you for randomly blocking rude people. I appreciate that. Moderators are always appreciated. I don't usually have one. It's very rare. And I know I got lots of unsolicited um, <clears throat> requests, but you guys, you know, like I accept um, 
payment. If you want to hire me to read whatever you want me to read or wear something else or stand up and walk around, you, you kind of have to um, pay me money for that. So if you want to donate, you know, we'll do a little fashion runway or something, but otherwise, you know, like everybody else, just to sit down and shut up. Right. <laughs> it's just kind of a thing here. I just kind of do what I want, but no, if you really have a request, it's not hard. It's not hard. What am I looking for here? Why is this stuff even on here? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Show Bob. You know I'm going to be commenting that on the next live stream. He's like, show me your bobs, man. Show bobs. Have the bucha. Oh man, it's, it's, if I play the wrong song, <clears throat> I will get booted off live instantly. If I play something copyrighted, it's just instant shutdown. Like, oh my goodness. So we got to go obscure with it. We got to go niche. Are you? Hi, Jordan. Hi, Tony. Hi, Muhammad. I mean, if you want me to do drugs, you're gonna have to donate money. Drugs are expensive, y'all. JK. I was in I was spend it on um I was spend it on plants. Edible plants. I'm just fucking around now. How you breaking the required I hear your voice like a choir. You drown the noise like it's quiet. We ain't had a post that summer. We was broke that summer. Stay the float that summer. Try to coast that summer. How we both drank under the tides. Draw a road map, burn it and hide. Like a phone tap, they don't reply. It's quiet.
Take you Thank you, Easy. Why well, you guys thirsty tonight? You should drink some water. I feel like I'm gonna have to change the um, audience for this one because of some of the book themes, some of the things that were mentioned in the stories, some uh, slightly racy content there. I never remember those scenes, but then when I reread the book, I'm like, oh yeah, oh yeah, that, <laughs> oh yeah, that part. Hi, Billy. Ace, you made it. You done hanging out with the boys? You missed the story time. I've been streaming for four hours and 19 minutes. We're almost at 420. Oh, how's the battery life? Let's see here. I'm at 28%. That's pretty decent. Where am I 
leather skirt. I'm from the US, Steven, where are you from? I'm always amazed at how many of you guys don't know me already. I thought y'all were just here because you knew me. Yeah, I just read um, some short stories. You know, a little Ursula, a little Harlan Ellison, you know. I may, have, you know what, you may have heard one of those stories before Ace. I may have like read it forever ago, like on my Patreon. Oh, welcome from Canada. Thanks for joining. It's only 9.30 here. It feels like it's so late. So late for you guys. It's midnight already. Cute. <laughs> Ooh, there's my hat. I think I lost my, oh, I put the feather back. The feather keeps falling out. Hi, Tomas. West Coast, baby. Hair's not. That was not the. Why is it flat right here? That's what I want to know. Anyway, I was reading for a while, so I'm just being silly now. <laughs> no, I've been in a little bit of an 80s mode there. There we go. I gave myself a side ponytail yesterday. Um, I don't know if I took a picture of it though. Whoa. Oh yeah, I had my heels on earlier. Just being, just being fun. I got these at the Goodwill, aren't they cute? <laughs> ready to go out in my crop top and my leather skirt and my uh, jacket that's all I need really you don't need like a full crop tops are in baby crop tops are in it's the new style jacket's actually really warm. I know it's cold here, but like, it's actually really warm. No, it's a black leather skirt. I mean, I do own a blue skirt. I'm not sure what you're asking there. I do own, <laughs> I do own many colors of skirts, trust me. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's interesting. Um, you can you can pay me money and then I'll go put on a blue skirt. I mean uh, Yeah, you can it, the cash app is right there. So if you want to cash app me, I'll put on a blue skirt I'm pretty easy to please See, now that looks more 80s when I put all my hair in the front <clears throat> and make it look like I've 
maybe shave the back of my head. I've been I've been rewatching some 80s videos, you guys. Why? Okay, that's the front. Am I right or am I right? Super long hair on top, shaved off in the back. That's 80s looking right there. Except for the spaghetti strap. You never, you never see the spaghetti strap. Like, mm -mm. <laughs> Oh, you don't like the hat? You can pay me money to take the hat off. What that? I'm not. <laughs> That's funny, y'all. That's funny. You must be new here. Yeah, must be new here if you try and tell me what to do. That has backfired since uh, circa 2012. <laughs> My goodness. Ace, were you and the boys? What were you and the boys drinking? Did you have the beers? Did you have the beers? The fancy beers? been drinking but um i stay altered i stay altered we have a fine fine vintage tonight it's called um biscotti pancakes we've got somewhere around a 30 percent the biscotti pancakes <laughs>
Oh, how would you say? Blocked? <laughs> Giving orders is not respectful. You can say please and you can say thank you. You all need to learn some manners. All the boys need to learn manners. But the men already know. Okay, so unsolicited help. The unsolicited help. <clears throat> Thank you, Ace. I was going to block it permanently. You just gave him a timeout. That was nice. He was getting annoying. I agree. voice was starting to like give out just a little bit reading um probably because I wasn't drinking water that's so smart of me I love that I love that for me I'm glad I did put on my real glasses like halfway through I forgot there was a couple poems that are short. This one's called The Rapture by Tom Dish. Suddenly it is all clear. I am this naked body here, hung like a bulb upon the tree of Earth's exploded history. My flesh is from a sauna glows and see how my erection grows. The world becomes a single flame and I am naked without shame. It is salvation to be lost in such a happy holocaust, embraced by the apocalypse of flesh and fire come to grips. 
bomb Rome and ravish South St. Paul, make every damned Episcopal pay for all the days they've seized, burn like the sun and be well pleased. From every living cell release its prisoners to cloudy peace, redeem, destroy, and fill with joy all Africa and Illinois. Lift us higher, make us see the vistas of eternity, how the godless squirm in hell, their meat napalmed into a gel. How the blessed are whirled and tossed, broiled by flames of Pentecost, and how at last I'm made to feel that these bones live and I am real. Lovely lovely happy stuff I've been reading all night. I just want to go back and look at the pictures from um, Harlan Ellison's story, uh, The Region Between. So this, this one is hard to show you without you experiencing the odd writing. So I, I did try to show all of that, um, which is why I kept showing the pages because like, it's so integral, the weirdness. Um, and sometimes when the text, I mean, it doesn't go full house of leaves, but like, it definitely, has has its moments and then of course we read the spiral which was fun that was difficult it's slow and difficult this one I think there's a better way to read that I just read one side and then the other but I think it's a back and forth conversation I mean I've read this many times over the years but never out loud like I've never really read this whole thing aloud. So we, we may have to go through some of the other stories. Wood is a really good one, very short. It's a pretty good one. There's one I really like. Um, I don't remember which title it is. Oh, there's this one, Diary of a Dead Man, Dust. All these short stories are freaking whack. Like, totally crazy. A Draft of El Canto Chi. is really good, too. I think that's the one I was just thinking of that I didn't know the name of. I opened right up to it. This is the one with Garamond in it. Maybe not. Wait. Yes. Gutenberg. Wow. That one's weird. I don't know if that one will actually translate written out loud. I mean, even when you... <laughs> they say it's weird out loud as if it's not weird when you're reading it. It's very weird. Either way, I'm pretty sure. But this one um, is also one of my favorite stories. I have like five favorite stories in the book, okay? No, there's no pulled punches. It is full on existential crisis weirdness. Yeah. So. Oh my gosh. The, the, and there's so many that I didn't like. Of Space Time and the River is also really good. I gotta read more of these. I, um, I'm kind of tired though. Yeah, all of Ellison's story. Like anything, anything of his that I read that I didn't realize it was him, that later when I like clocked, oh. I can look up authors' lives and they're like, oh, wait, I've already read a bunch of his stuff. Like, it's already lodged in my brain. I just didn't realize I was reading him. Delightful queasiness is, yeah, that's a good way to describe it. Um, yeah. I don't know. What did you think of the spiral part, Travis? 
Or is that when you did you did did your phone blink out right then? Oh, you missed that. Oh my goodness. That was a good one. That was my favorite part, I think, of that story. I think that's, I mean, that's basically the climax of the story. And the weird, <laughs> the weird numbers for the, like, the chapters, um, really, I mean, because it's called the region between, I think it really, really hits home because you got one, One and a half. One and three quarters. And then two. Which is like, I don't know. That always stuck with me. Where's the other poem? Let me find the other poem. I think one of the comments, somebody was like telling me to calm down. Like, no, I'm reading an intense story and I get into it. Like, I'm not going to calm the fuck down. Thank you. Moderators are the best, obviously. Um, telling me to like calm down is the easiest way to like make me more dramatic. I mean, I thought that was common knowledge at this point. Okay, Rapture, there was that one poem. Times Hitch, page 373. Salam. Robert Frazier. Wow, that's a that's a nice crazy bit right there. Transposed to the ship's brain from engrams to encodes in the moments after termination, I now glide the warp like a water strider. I don't know why I'm being weird with the camera. I'm gonna put it down. I'm getting weird with it. Transposed to the <clears throat> Transposed to the ship's brain from engrams to encodes in the moments after termination, I now glide the warp like a water strider. Thus pinioned, I shunt my passengers coldly from node to millennial node, shimmering along the meniscus of a mirror. When the warp branches eddies into streams, then it's mostly white water tumbling us like a boulder between sheer cliffs. Thus freed, I ferry freely, unlitting centuries and offloading my cargo on green and growing shores. When my raft runners turn time tourists, then I'm the timeless river rat, silent and aloof and grim at the great rudder. And in the campfire glimmer of my monitors, their faces glow. I scan for signs of aging, canali across planets I'll never know. This book also is full of so many words that I'm sure I've looked up and forgotten. I don't have the best memory for obscure, obscure, obscure words. We, I can't remember the one I hit earlier. Harlan Ellison pushes me to the limit of my vocabulary. And so do like all these other authors. I remember looking up what an obol was for a first time, which is a type of money from a certain culture. Right, like so it's a coin, but she puts a copper sequence 
in place of the coin because she's like a mentally handicapped kid that doesn't know what's going on <laughs> in that first story. Anyway, what am I looking up? A word. Canali. It looks like canal, so we'll see. That doesn't make sense. It's a brand, but I don't think that's... Let's look up the what it means. Hmm. It's an old brand, so it's not capitalized, so I don't... Hmm. Hmm. Meaning. Channels. Channels. It is a plural of channels. As the campfire glimmer of my monitors, their faces glow. I scan for signs of aging. Canali across planets I'll never know. Channels. Con like conduit or channel. Across planets I'll never know. So... I take this as like transposed to the ship's brain from engrams to encodes. They took like someone's brain or something is in the brain of the ship and is now gliding the warp like a water strider. Um, and then in the second stanza it says, thus pinioned, I shunt my passengers coldly from node to millennial node. So they're stuck there. They're pinioned. That's pretty. That's pretty brutal sounding. I was trying to hide that person. Thank you. Good night, Steven. Tapping out. Huh? Peace. Thanks for joining. Um, shimmering along the meniscus of a mirror. I love the meniscus because that's the edge. Like when you have like a uh, water that is like formed, like, you know, when you fill a cup to the brim and it kind of goes up, that tension is the meniscus. The, like the curve is the meniscus. Like a water drop is, is round because the tension creates the meniscus. So the meniscus of a mirror is just like such... They kind of don't have it, but they kind of do. Like, it's kind of like a really cool way to portray that in my mind. Thus freed, I ferry freely, unlitting centuries and off loading my cargo on green and growing shores when my raft runners turn time tourists then i'm the timeless river rat silent and aloof and grim at the great rudder and as in the campfire glimmer of my monitors their faces glow i scan for signs of aging canali across planets i'll never know so it's like a ship following some kind of like lines They can like, it's like time travel, but like, it's like warp speed travel across certain like lines. Anyway, I get this really cool picture in my head from that one. That is the two poems. Um, <clears throat> I am kind of losing my voice, so I should probably go. Plus it's been almost five hours. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Um, it was fun. I was not feeling super great. So, um, yes, had a little extra time to be on YouTube today. Uh, thank you for everybody that has donated before. I know it's like two or three of you, but thank you. <laughs> everybody else really needs to pick up some slack like one dollar five dollars you can get stuff on on my patreon so check out my patreon and stuff 
or hit up the cash app or something. Um, but have a good weekend and maybe I'll see you next weekend. The synth and pedal expo is happening and I was kind of thinking about going with my camera. I wonder if I could live stream from the synth and pedal expo. I don't know if my internet would handle it. Anyway, good to see you. Thanks for coming back, my friends that have already been here. Yeah, no. <laughs> the most random, the most random of comments. I get trolls from all over. Fun time. Oh my goodness. All right, phone battery's getting low too. Sweet dreams, have a good night. Oh, it's only 10 o'clock here. So I'm gonna um, maybe drink some tea and try to get my voice back. <clears throat> I had fun. You can catch the replay. And catch the replay. Mwah. <laughs>